Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the BBCA Regional Forum 3. Um, thank you for all being here. Um, I don't think any of us can quite believe it's been you know, 13 or 14 weeks since we started doing um, online webinars and training and, and forums. So yeah, time flies when you're having fun. And, and thank you. We've got over 130 people joining us today. And I know you know, things are maybe getting a little bit busier for everybody, um, especially with the wasp season and, you know, maybe a bit clear on what we can do and what we can't do and getting out there. So, yeah, I really appreciate and we really appreciate you guys joining us today and taking this time to, you know, um, keep up the industry, keep up with what's going on and just have a bit of interaction with us. That's great. Really good to see. Um, I said, I hope you're all staying really well and safe. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll have a, a great session today full of lots of good talks. Just before I'm going to go through the agenda just quickly. You should all have it in front of you. Um, but before I do that, just a few housekeeping items. So just as a reminder, um, myself and any of the presenters, none of us can see you. So if you have um, any questions, then please make sure that you use the Q&A section at the end of each presentation. Um, we'll pause for five or ten minutes. I'll read through any questions that you guys stick on there um, for the presenter and they'll be able to answer it for you. Um, any questions we don't get to, hopefully we can pull those off at the end and then get some answers for you. Any technical issues that you have, so um, it might be connection or anything else like that, use the chat section. So this bit's really important because if you put any questions that you have for the presenters in the chat section, we're not going to see those. So um, we do have a colleague of mine, Scott, keeping an eye on it. So if there is anything um, you put in there that he feels needs to be on the Q&A section, he will advise you on that. So anything technical, make sure that you or technical problems with the um, online or the webinar, then make sure you get it in the chat section. OK, Fab. Um, in terms of CPD, so you all signed up today and registered, you would have put your CPD, um, whichever scheme you're on, details. Um, so once today is over, we'll go through those lists and update your CPD points for you. Um, we've got three for each scheme today, so that's great. Um, great, okay, so the agenda. Um, there's a slight change, I'll, I'll, I'll um, go into that in a moment just for myself, but coming up first, we have Tony Knight from Lodi UK, who's going to be talking about bed bugs um, approach uh, and planning and treatment options. So um, nice good update for that. Um, I'll then be popping back on. You'll be seeing me for uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Now, I was originally going to be doing a health and safety accreditation talk. But unfortunately, due to um, unforeseen circumstances, we, we can't do a health and safety topic. So um, I hope it's all been updated on your um, agendas. And I'll be doing a talk on um, bees and wasps. Um, it's a few questions. It'll be a bit of fun as well. But I think it's that time of the season when we need to address it. Uh, we'll have a comfort break then as well um, at 10.55 until 11.05, just so you can go off, get a cup of tea or coffee, have a quick comfort break, um, and then we'll come back for the um, later morning session. Um, we are having a sponsored slot by um, the Killgerm, Rob Simpson from Killgerm, talking about um, alternatives to FICMW, as we know that's going out at the end of the year. Um, we need to be using them up um, uh, until December. So, yeah, Rob will we'll go through some really good alternatives that, that we have for FICMW. Um, and then after Rob, we've got Clive Bowes from Pest Management Consultancy. He'll be talking about insect behaviour and biology. Um, so great. Some, some really you know, detailed, um, interesting subjects, a lot of insect based. But I think it's really important this time of year, you know, with the change of weather, um, obviously warming up, we've got a lot more insect activity. So, yeah, fabulous. Um, and then we just finish off an update from our CEO, Ian Andrew, um, about COVID-19, um, association news and any other industry updates that you know, he feels that is important for you guys to know about. And we're looking to, to end the session by 12.30 today. So you guys can get off and have a great afternoon um, out and about. OK, fabulous. So we can get, get started. If I could ask for Tony to start his video when requested by Scott, that would be great. And I will wave goodbye to you just temporarily. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Natalie. Take care. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, just to repeat what Natalie said, thanks so much for tuning into this live webinar this morning. Uh, as I said, my name's Tony. I'm from Lodi UK. Uh, this is the point where you're all reaching for your volume button, because I do apologise. I am rather loud. I do appreciate it. Hopefully you don't choose to mute me, uh, but we will see how we get on. Uh, for those of you who do know me, I'm sure you're having quite a chuckle right now and wondering how on earth I got myself into this situation. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, 
they're probably right to be having a little bit of a chuckle, but we'll do our best. We'll see how we get on. Can I just apologise for the lockdown look? Uh, believe it or not, it is in fashion right now. Maybe not entirely out of choice, uh, but we're going with it. And frankly, I went to the lawnmower earlier and I had no fuel. So we'll just have to put up with it and take me as I am, if you don't mind. Now, when I started in this industry, if I just share my presentation with you, Oh, I knew things would go wrong. Here we go. Let's go back to the beginning. Right, there we go. Opening slide. Always fun and games. I'm not exactly technical. Um, when I first started in this industry, about 11, 12 years ago now, the person who trained me showed me a video. And so I thought, why not? Let's start with exactly the same video. I have been warned you might not have volume, which kind of ruins the music, but we will give it a go. It will still give you the idea. So, yes, we are here today to talk about bed bugs. Let's not play it again. You don't want to see it again. Uh, I do remember when I first saw that video, I thought, blimey, if that is what one does to you, what on earth would it be like if you do have a mass infestation? And so let's get talking about how we deal with these little critters, shall we? I thought I'd start things off with a few little fun facts for you, a bit of history. Uh, the first known ancestor, first family of bed bugs, bed bugs actually emerged around 115 million years ago. It is actually believed that the early species of bed bug did feed off the dinosaurs. Uh, if you do share my sort of level of humor, I did find it quite funny to picture the mighty Tyrannosaurus Rex with bed bug bites all down his back and desperately with those piddly little arms trying to have a scratch. So yes, they have been doing their head in and our head in for many, many years. But it is fair to say that even back then, they preferred a host whose home they could invade rather than actually living on the host himself. They didn't appreciate the roaming lifestyle of a dinosaur, and they very quickly evolved to feed on warm-blooded creatures such as bats and birds around the late Cretaceous period. So a day like today, the bedbugs would happily sunbathe, drinking their cocktail, waiting in that nest of the bird, waiting in the bat cave, and along they would come back at the end of day or the end of night in the case of bats and food would be served. Basically, this was always their preferred method. This here on the right hand side of your screen um, is a fossil, the oldest known fossil of a bed bug, which can be linked to human feeding. Uh, this fossil actually dates back 11,000 years and it was found in the caves in Oregon in the US Midwest alongside basically fossilized human remains. It did say feces as well, but I didn't see the need to write that on the slide. Uh, but this did obviously show that bed bugs were at this point starting to feed off human blood. Now, bizarrely, uh, there was a while, a period in time where actually being bitten by a bed bug was seen as a good thing. Uh, in Rome in 77 AD, it was published in some natural history journals that bed bugs had medicinal properties uh, that would actually help to treat snake bites and ear infections. And as late as the 1800s, it was actually thought they could treat hysteria. I'm sure most of you will agree that it was more likely that they're gonna create hysteria than actually treat it. Uh, but they did believe some strange things back then. This also here on the right hand side is a notice from 1499, warning of the potential of bed bugs in your bed. So it is a problem that has been around for a long old time. If we wanna focus on the UK, they believe the first bed bugs were in the UK in 1583, and that they first became a problem in London in the 18th century. And it's thought that they came to London on the wood that was used to rebuild after the Great Fire. So there you go, the wonders of Google. Hopefully that has given you a little bit of history, a little bit of rundown. Next survey you go do, 
you can share some of those amazing facts and, and impress them with your knowledge. So let's get on with the approach. How do we identify the problem in the first place? How do we actually establish that we are dealing with bed bugs? Obviously, you're going to start on the phone. So it's all about asking some key questions. What you're trying to establish is, are they currently sharing their bed with a bed bug? So the first question is, have you seen any live bed bugs? Now, in their mind, they're probably seeing something a little bit like this, but you might want to help them out, maybe send them a picture and suggest that it's more likely to look something like this. Obviously, seeing bed bugs, as you all know, is not as easy as it may sound. They do like to hide away, go to places where people can't find them. So some other things you might wish to ask them is, have they seen any blood spotting on their sheets in the morning where they have been bitten overnight? Or for that matter, do they have any bite marks? We are not obviously talking regards young love here. We are talking about small, itchy bites. And the location of them on the body will also help you to establish whether we are, in fact, dealing with bed bugs. Uh, they are often mixed up with fleas. If you have got a flea issue, you tend to find that they will bite on the lower parts of the body. So you're going to find those bites on the feet, on the lower legs, those sort of places. Whereas if we've got a case of bed bugs, they tend to target more the face, the neck, the shoulders and down the back, very much like the photo in that bottom corner there. You also tend to find with bed bugs that they'll they'll bite along a line. So you'll tend to find they form a line up the body, very much like you see there. If you are satisfied that they do have a bed bug issue, uh, the next case is going to be to arrange a visit and to obviously go in and carry out a survey. Now, you do want to do a very detailed survey. You want to be looking absolutely everywhere and ideally finding bed bugs themselves. They do like harbourages, dark places, places where they're hidden. They're not just going to be there on the mattress waving at you going, come on in. Um, you are going to tend to have to look around the headboard, around the entire mattress of the bed, lifting up those seams underneath the buttons, for example. And other classic places are in the frameworks of the bed, obviously the joints where the legs meet the frame, uh, places like this. Now, it's not just the bed. You want to be searching that entire room. So classic places are things like the, the bedside tables and drawers behind picture frames and mirrors. You might even, if you're being very thorough, want to lift up the edges of the carpets, look along those skirting boards and even maybe undo light fittings, plug sockets. They do like to hide out in there. So you really are going to have a thorough, thorough search around. Now, if while you're doing this, you do find yourself salivating, um, I think I said that right, uh, drooling, basically, at the thought of having a chicken corner this evening, uh, it quite possibly is because you've picked up the scent of crushed almonds. Goodness knows why. I don't know why, but supposedly that is a clear smell and a clear sign of a high bed bug infestation. So if you do pick that up, that would be another helpful si signal. Finally, like all of us, they do poo. Uh, so if you're not finding the live bed bugs themselves, uh, when you do lift up those, those cushions, look under the seams of the mattress, like in that picture in the bottom right there, uh, you will often see these dark black splodges, which is their excreta marks. And all these things will basically help you to establish that there is a problem and you at that point know that it's time to get yourself in there and carry out a treatment for them. Now, cross checks. These are absolutely essential. A classic sort of error is I've got bed bugs in this room. This is the room I'm going to treat. Uh, but it isn't quite as simple as that. These little guys do like to migrate, they do move around. And so in this picture, for example, we have bed bugs in room 208. We've found them, we've seen them, we know there's a problem, but the cross check is vital. So if this is someone's residential home, you want to be obviously checking all the other bedrooms on that floor, seeing if there's evidence of any in those rooms as well. And don't forget downstairs. They may well be in the living room, in the sofas, in the chairs. So carrying out a thorough cross check is vital. If we're talking about a hotel, yes, we say we've got bed bugs in room 208. But we may find they have also moved into room 209, possibly also in room 207. You get the idea. But once you have found them in 209, you then need to be checking room 211 as well. And it's like a snake. Just keep going along 
until you get to a room where there aren't any and you know you've found sort of the the area within which they've spread you also have to check above and below so in a hotel room 108 room 308 do make sure you're checking all around it's not just about that part of the hotel bed bugs are complicated you know all this but if we are in a hotel those cleaners are going to have gathered up the sheets on the bed taken them down that nice little staircase there and taken them to hang out in the laundry so that is another place that you must must go check if you're going to get on top of a bed bug problem you've basically got to solve it within the entire property it is no point just targeting one place you must make sure you've cleared it throughout so you're now planning for the job uh, yes this does involve a coffee coffee and a newspaper they're an essential part of your day so do make sure while you're reading your coffee while you're reading your coffee while you're drinking your coffee having a read through that newspaper you're also going through the various risk assessments in your head uh, these include a site assessment an environmental set assessment and of course kosh uh, as part of this you're going to come out of it with what you need to be wearing in terms of the correct ppe uh, obviously for your sake i hope you have it right now because it's not exactly easy to get hold of uh, but assuming you do have everything there this is all pre-preparation before you even start getting going on the treatment itself. Now, one of the first things to do is obviously prepare that room. Now, this is something that the customer could do or you may wish to take on your own, take on yourself. And that is just simply to bag up and secure all the bed linen, all the sheets, everything sort of clothing wise that can be removed from that room and may be infested. It's always advisable to double double bag up this stuff. I've always said in life, it's better to be safe than sorry. So do double bag. Uh, and when you have removed it from that room, take it to the wash, put it on the highest temperature possible in order to kill the bed bugs that might be present on those things. In terms of preparing the room, it's advisable to sort of move all the cabinets, move the bed out away from the wall, sort of bring everything towards the center of the room so that you've got easy access to everywhere and you can go around and spray and treat absolutely everything. As I mentioned earlier, you can, if you choose, loosen the carpets away from the floor. Uh, if you are being particularly thorough, don't, don't electrocute yourself. Do turn off the ele electricity and then unscrew your light fittings, your fixtures, so you can move all these away and it opens up the opportunity for dusting in those, as you will find that a lot of bed bugs do hang out in those sort of locations. The final sort of warning for your customers, you don't want them to be embarrassed. Uh, you are going to be rummaging around in their bedside tables and cabinets. Uh, so they do, if they do have any personal belongings uh, that they may wish not to be there and for you to come across, do just make it clear to them that anything that is removed from that room could be a harborage for bed bugs. So do thoroughly check it before you do take it anywhere else. So we come into the actual treatments themselves. Um, there's obviously a few options in terms of treatment. I do feel that generally people do still turn to chemical as the first port of call. I've used this picture here. Um, there's obviously a number, many products available out there that can be used for treating bed bugs. This is from straight from our brochure and it just demonstrates nice cycles. So there are some manufactured loaded products on here. But as I say, whatever you choose to use is going to do a good job for you. And there are still a lot of options out there. I'm always hearing that there aren't many bed bug products anymore, but it's not true. Um, there are a vast array of things that you can choose to use. The key is using as many as possible. Um, these aren't easy to kill. They're right little nightmares, in all honesty. Um, so the more chemicals you throw at them and the more visits that you do, the better. Bed bugs are not really a one visit job. You should be really looking at doing two, possibly three visits. And as I say, mixing up the products each time you go. Personally, I always think it's quite sensible to start with a liquid concentrate. You're basically looking for something that offers a strong knockdown to really get on top of them quickly. But then obviously the longer the residual, the better. Uh, we do now have um, this new micro encapsulation technology with residuals, which extends their use. You have it in products like our phobie caps, but also like the K-Offrin. Uh, these will obviously extend out that residual period. And if you do have the option to add an IGR, an insect growth regulator, to that mix, 
This obviously helps as well to disrupt the development of the bed bug itself. So it will kill off those eggs. It will stop the nymphs developing into adults. And all this just assists with getting on top of the job. Second visit, first visit, whichever way around you want to do it. But if you want to mix things up a bit, obviously wettable powders are a very good option when it comes to bed bugs. There is obviously a huge hoo-ha at the moment about the about the, the FICAM W going off the market. I know Rob's going to speak about that in detail later. Uh, but just because FICAM has gone, it doesn't mean it is the end of wettable powders. There are others out there like the C40, like Citral 40. So you can obviously mix things up, bring in that powder around the floors and walls in those light fittings and sockets that we talked about earlier. The final sensible option um, would be, if you can, to treat the mattress. Uh, tricky now. Obviously, one of the big things about Bike MW was this ability to treat mattresses with it. Um, options are limited now. I've put Phobidose RTU here as one, uh, but there are various pyrethrin products, I believe, again, the Kaofrin, uh, that can be sprayed on the mattress. And this obviously is a sensible idea. Um, if, the if the mattress is absolutely crawling, um, I would fully suggest that you try and convince the customer to get rid of it and buy themselves a new one. Uh, but if we are talking a light infestation, spraying around those seams, getting rid of the bed bugs that are harboring around there is obviously a sensible way to go. As I say, chemical treatment does tend to be the way people go, but it is not the only option by any means. Uh, another popular option becoming more and more popular is to carry out a heat treatment. Uh, now, using a heat pod is not going to be something that's available to all of you, but if you are able to do it, this obviously removes the need to take anything away from the room because the heat of the pod will kill any bed bugs within the bedding itself, in those furnishings, in any clothes, because you literally enclose everything within it. Um, the DNA of bed bugs actually starts to break down at a temperature of over 45 degrees centigrade. Uh, but to actually kill the bed bugs and the eggs, you need to be going over 50 degrees centigrade and you do need a treatment of a period of several hours to actually get rid of that problem. A simpler method of heating is to use a steamer such as the Cymax Eradicator. Uh, you can obviously use this along the seams, along the buttons of the mattress, and it will that, that, that way kill all stages of the bed bug itself. Now you can go the complete opposite way to heat. Yes, you guessed it, it is a cold treatment. Just like heat will kill them, severe cold will do the same thing. Um, some people might not like the idea of heating their clothing and risk damaging it. Um, so if you are able to bag them up, put them in the freezer, a temperature lower than minus 20 degrees centigrade should do the job if you leave them in there for a few days just to kill off again all stages of the cycle. Uh, there are actually freezing sprays out there, things such as the Organex spray. Um, you can obviously just simply go along the seams with this. It's a way of not applying chemical to the mattress. Obviously, you might not be comfortable doing that. Your customer might not want you to do that. Um, so if you do lift up those seams under the buttons, just spray something like this and on contact, the freeze will kill the insects and the eggs. Now, do remember that both heat and cold treatments uh, do offer no residual. So you are going to go in there, you're going to have a big impact at the time, but there's nothing to stop the bed bugs returning. And so it is sensible to sort of use these in conjunction with some sort of chemical treatment. Regardless of whatever way you've gone, they do have a habit of coming back. As good as you all are at your jobs, they are stubborn. Um, so at the end of any job, it is sensible to put down some bed bug monitors, making sure you're using the right sort of pheromone. Um, and this way you can keep it monitored and check that the treatment has been successful. That, if you like, is my run through. I, I hope I haven't taught you all how to suck eggs. I appreciate all of you are far more educated in the treatment of bed bugs than me, but it's always nice to have a sort of refresher and go through things. Um, I've obviously touched on a few products, a few things in there that you might have further questions about. My contact details are right there. I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, but now's the bit that I've been fearing the life out of, because this is the bit where I get questions that I don't know what are coming. So oh, I think sorry, Natalie's popped back off. I'll stop the share.
we've got five questions in there so far for you. So I've had a little nose. I think most of them should be should be good for you to go and straightforward. So I'll, I'll go through them. Um, so we've got a question here. If we dust with chemicals in electrical sockets, do we need to remove the dust at the end of the treatment? Uh, I don't believe you do, Natalie. No. Um, obviously, you, you, you're going to put the electric, you're going to put screw it all back in. You're going to put the power back on. So you should be absolutely fine in that respect. It shouldn't be a problem. Great. Um, okay, another question. So, can lava tops be tank mixed and other formulate with other formulations safely, or does it need to be used in a second independent treatment? No, it, it can. Yeah, um, it can be mixed. Um, there was a case with Nylar, which I'm sure a lot of people used, that I think was very specific on the label in terms of listing certain things that it can be mixed with. The lava box is an open label, so be it um, by Cam when by Cam was around. Whatever product it is, you can mix it in no problem. Just add 10 mils to a five litre mix. Fabulous. Um, next question. So, can we use impregnated polymer mesh on mattress covers against bed bug infestations? Oh, goodness. I knew there'd be one, Natalie, honestly. <laughs> do, you, do you know the answer to that? No, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> no, absolutely don't. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe something that you know um, who is it who's, is, is it Iman Khan has popped that question on there so I'm assuming that you'll be happy for them to get in touch with you and you can have a look of into course, it. Of course absolutely and I'll I'll ask my more technical friends for an answer on that one but I don't want to try and answer when I don't know it in fairness so I'll. No I'll no absolutely I'm, yeah. yeah don't expect you to know all the all the answers to everything that's you know that's the uh, um, the industry for you isn't it? I'll, absolutely. Let me get some of them. <laughs> Um, okay, just uh, from Graham. Graham here. Did I hear correctly? Can phobie larvox be mixed with phobie caps um, and any other residuals? You kind of answered that a little moment yes. ago. Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. Fabulous. Uh, a couple more here. So I'm not sure we we'll know this one, but um, in terms of COVID-19, um, can bed bugs help with the spreading of it? Oh my word! Um, who knows? Is yeah. the answer. I don't think we're meant to be getting in each other's beds at the moment, so no, no, that right. answers the question. So no, no, I don't think so. I'm going to say I don't think anybody would know that for a, a <laughs> time, but um, but yeah. So no, I'm with you on that. I don't think anybody would uh, would know that. But I thought I'd read out. Interesting. Yeah. You know, yes, of course. Um, okay, so hi Tony. What about clothes, shoes, and other stored items in wardrobes, please? Most people don't have freezers big enough for clothing and can't dry clean everything. Yeah, tricky. Okay, obviously you don't want to be spraying them with chemical. Um, you could use the freeze sprays that are out there. They're a possible option if you wanted to gather everything in the wardrobe. The freeze sprays don't leave any residual. You obviously do have to be careful because making something extremely cold can damage it mm. but that would be one option i could think of is just is just blasting them with some extreme cold mm. just making sure you clear them that way i think i did know of a company once that um actually almost hired out their freezing services so they'd had they had a storage facility with you know big freezers in it and they said well look if they haven't got the facility to actually freeze it themselves they'll take it away almost like a a freezing service and then freeze it for them but again that depends on obviously each company's uh, availability yeah absolutely great um okay i've got four more here so can organ x pro be used on clothing uh yes again it's a it's a natural polymer product that one um it is designed to kill on target and doesn't leave any residual so i don't see why not frankly that is another one that that can be sorry the organx pro i'm thinking of the polymer but he might be referring to the free spray again so yeah if he is again i've already answered that yes you can just spray it from a distance don't spray it from like two inches away because it it probably will cause damage that way but if you stand back and spray it it should be absolutely fine great um insecticide and temperature treatment can be used side by side i think that's a question there so can it can insecticide and temperature be used side by side afterwards so my understanding is you would carry out the heat treatment allow that to act for the, the hours that are necessary and then once you've removed all that equipment you obviously then could put down a chemical treatment afterwards just to add that residual impact yeah absolutely a lot of companies that do that i think yeah because with the any heat treatments if you do it beforehand it will probably completely destroy the insecticide uh, active yeah, yeah. anyway wouldn't it so no absolutely the chemical comes after definitely 
fabulous. Um, so residual liquids don't affect, sorry, residual liquids, do they affect humans in the long term? No. I think that's a general question. Yeah, that, that they obviously all chemicals go through HSE, go through approval, they're thoroughly tested. And if there was any risk, they would always be listed on the safety sheet. But once mm. a residual chemical is dry, mm. uh, the general trend is that both humans and animals are safe to return. That's it. I think also with the, in terms of uh, technicians using the chemicals, you know, the PPE is needed because that may be long term, you know, use of it over a period of years could build up, you know, any problems if they didn't have the PPE. But yeah, res res residents in, in properties, generally that one off treatment is going to absolutely have no harmful effect, is it? Absolutely. Fabulous. Uh, another four more, no, three more. Uh, we've got a good five minutes, so you're, we're good to go, carry on. Um, would IGR not create super nymphs freezing? them at their stage of development and increase feeding Does that makes sense to you it, well it, it just depends yeah he's saying depending on the stage the nymph is in mm -hmm. is it going to cause more harm than good at being frozen it's one of those balance acts you you're doing it to stop the eggs hatching you're doing it to stop nymphs developing into full breeding adults which is obviously also a problem uh, but don't forget you have put down a residual insecticide as well so hopefully it's still going to be killing a lot of these bed bugs anyway. Um, tricky one again, Natalie. I'm, I'm, I would say it sort of balances out, if you like, in that respect. Absolutely. Um, morning, guys. Surely steam is the best possible option since it is chemical free. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> it's one of those. If you don't want to go in with chemical, absolutely. But not everyone has got a steamer in their armory. I certainly deal with a lot of companies and a lot lot more use chemical than steaming but absolutely if that is your preference everyone always says if you could avoid using chemical do but it's a personal choice really absolutely absolutely get. it's on that hierarchy if you can use it brilliant you know if you yeah. can stay away from chemicals great but if you can't you know kind of go down the list of not you know least toxic and work your way up so it's great yeah. um hi tony what's the medical significance uh, what's the medical significance if it's biased or, or in case any disease due to bed bugs? What type of disease may occur? How can we cure that? Can you explain it? Oh, goodness. Right. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. I'm sure you yeah. can probably tell. Um, so, yeah, I'm really not sure again on that one, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah. Not, um, what type of diseases may occur? How they occur? Yeah. Explain it. I'm just, yeah. It's, um, it, yeah. It, in terms, I think the disease is being transmitted. They say with bed bugs, they've got all the mechanical ability to do it. But for some reason, we, we've never really found that connection, have we? No. Um, I don't believe it. so. No. Um, but yeah, in terms, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, Okay, um, I have read that bed bugs can go into diapores for up to a year. How do we counteract that with a treatment? Just by treating absolutely everywhere you can. That's the only way. This is why I talked about taking the light fitments off the wall, really exploring everywhere. So you are trying your best to hunt out every location they might be. It's extremely difficult. If mm. you missed a particular spot, um, and there are a bunch of them hiding out in there. Yes, unfortunately, a year down the line, if they're going to come out, you're going to be back there doing a repeat job. But mm. frankly, we can't pull off the impossible. You're trying to clear the problem that's there. And then if it if it comes back after a year, then absolutely yes. I mean, in terms of the diapause, I think they go, they only really would go into that if they had a lack of food or the environment was pretty bad for them. So I think if you've been called to a job that's got an in, you know, a bed bug problem, it's generally because someone's living there. So they shouldn't really go into diapause if that's the case. But um, again, you know, bed bugs can do strange things, can't they? As um, I've heard several people say, I wouldn't want to be the first guest who go back into all the hotels in London after. No, no. <laughs> and uh, that's a classic example. They're all going to be starving. Um, yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I did never actually thought of that. Yeah, of course, I'll probably have some hotel stays coming up. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a thought for um yeah okay we've got a minute or so left i'm just going to do um there's, there's quite a few come through again um but let me try and find some so um what insect growth regulator do you recommend for bed bugs 
So I listed obviously the Phoebe Larvox, other insecticides have it built in. So Symmetrol Super, for example, has got the, the IGR, but what's lovely about something like the Larvox is it is independent. So whatever chemical you're choosing to use, you can obviously mix it in. I think there are some, I, I don't want to be biased, but I, I think there are some other IGRs out there, but I don't know their names if I'm honest. Okay. So Absolutely. yeah, any IGR will do the job basically when you're dealing with bed bugs. Great. And then the last question, I think it's a good one. Um, if you isolate clothing by vacuum bagging it, because it can be treated or cleaned easily, how long does it need to be isolated for? Um, and what is the, the life of a bed bug without food? Is kind of a generic statement. Yeah, so if you're removing all that bedding, all that shit, as I say, you either need to be heating it or freezing it um, to get rid of the problem. It's not a case of putting it away and isolating it for a certain period of time, because as we said, the bed bugs will continue to live in there. Um, you want to be either washing them on a, a, the highest temperature possible, or dry cleaning them, or the opposite way, as we say, they need to be put in the freezer for several days um, to get rid of all those life cycles. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'm You're welcome. People on there, but just haven't got time for all of them. So um, we've got some good questions there, though. Great. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thanks, Tony. I've actually managed to pull this off with the shirt and shorts look without anyone knowing. <laughs> yeah. so quite when proud of it, too. See. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Take care. Have a good day, absolutely. everyone. You bye, too. Bye, bye. Great. Fabulous. OK, so, um, yeah, excellent talk there. Hopefully we got We've got a lot of questions done. Um, unfortunately, we can't always get to all of them. But as always, you know, contact Tony direct or you can get in touch with the beef sale or your other suppliers if you've got any questions about, you know, bed bugs or products that you can be used, can be used for them. Um, you've now got me for uh, 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, I mentioned earlier that an original subject we were going to do was health and safety um, and accreditations and the things that you know, you need to be able to get your business ready to apply for these accreditations. But unfortunately, um, due to circumstances of conflict, because I'm a health and safety auditor for some schemes or a scheme, um, I, I can no longer do health and safety advice in that context. Um, you can still contact me direct and we can have a chat, no problem. But in terms of uh, a training or anything like that, it's, it's a bit tricky at the moment. So apologies for anybody that's logged on. Um, wanting to um, find out a bit more about health and safety accreditations. As I said, contact me directly um, and we can, we can have a chat about it, no problem. Um, in its place, so um, any of you that read our magazine, there's a section um, called um, Ask the Technical Team. It's just really, we get questions all week, the technical team, me, Dee, Kevin and, and various other um, people in the office, they'll come across um, sort of various questions, whether it's about health and safety or pests or chemicals. And, you know, we, we try to remember these questions and put them into our magazine um, so that everybody else can benefit from, you know, the answer to them. Um, it's a very brief section. So with this presentation, um, I've decided to do a uh, Ask the Technical Team Wasps and Bees section. Um, last week, I done a webinar on wasps and bees, and it was very active. There were a lot of questions, um, albeit some technical problems as well, but we returns that came in. I didn't manage to get to them all. And because of the time of year that we have now, you know, wasp nests are starting to get a bit more active. I've actually noticed one on my neighbour's house, which uh, like having a, a little look at not you know they're not doing anything about it there's no need to it's out of the way um but yeah they're starting to get more active going to be getting more cool so i think having this um uh, sort of a q a i'm going to pop up some questions on the screen um you know that you we can go through the, the questions that i got asked last week and didn't get around to answering them and it was those questions that i thought were really important possibly to you when you're out there out and about we're not talking about wasp biology or bee biology or anything like that it's just a uh, you know, real, what do I do in this situation? What about if this happens, what we, can we do? And uh, there's six questions on there that I had, that I think it's good for me to read out and go through what our answer would be. Um, and hopefully it can help you out. And as always, you can ask more questions. We've got the Q&A section that we just done with Tony. Um, if you've got anything coming off of these or any brand new questions, not a problem. Um, we, can, we can get through those. And, um, but just to start, we've got a, a poll that we're going to do. So if I could just ask for Scott to share the poll and you'll see a set of questions popping up in front of you. So um, the first one here, um, how many calls for bees do you get each year? So this can vary and the options are hardly any, um, 20 or above, 50 or above, 
um, and over 100. So if you all just have a, a vote on that in terms of, it's really interesting to see what we're all dealing with out there. Um, it usually takes about sort of 30 seconds or so for this to um, get answered. And I think it'd be interesting to, to you, the guys listening on what it is. So, okay, so we can see the answers there. 67 is still going. We just have a couple more seconds for them to get through all four questions. Okay. How long uh, is it? One minute we have, Scott? Yeah, so uh, another another 20 seconds. Okay. You can see the votes coming in now. They're just going through all four of the questions. Ah, yes, there we go. Fabulous. I think it's just good for you to be able to get in, involved and you know, click a few buttons. Maybe we're all kind of like, oh, blimey, Natalie's asking us to do things. Um, but yeah, just to, just to see um, what we're going. Go through the poll at the moment. Um, on like between 5 and 20 is um, getting the most answers there. Over 100. Some, some people get over 100 each year. So yeah, very, very busy for some of you. Scott, have we got all the questions up here? Sorry. Yeah, all four of them. Oh, I'm, okay, just, I'm, just under, I'm just ending the polling now. Shouldn't take a second. It's just trying okay. to do the maths. There, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see the results. Okay, great. So in terms of B calls then each year, um, so the biggest answer is between five and 20. So 32% um, of you, um, you know, you get a few, not a massive amount, but you get a few coming through. Um, and you know there are nine percent of you that get over a hundred. So we do we get a lot of B calls, and I think it's you know there are some bits here that we're going to address in terms of what to do with them. And I'm sure you've all looked into your own company processes and what your response is to customers that are ringing you asking you to deal with bees. Um, but yeah, I mean, so hardly any. Twenty seven percent say hardly any. Um, you know, and that's possibly none um, as well. So yeah, quite a big percentage that, that also get get no calls at all. Um, what is your usual advice to customers with bees? Um, so we had, you know, I tell them we do not deal with bees, 22% of you. Yeah, I hear that a lot when, when uh, members get in touch is that you just say, look, you know, we don't deal with it. And some members are concerned, though, with giving that advice that they will then go and find somebody else who will and they maybe wouldn't um, be as um, uh, professional about the treatment, possibly. I know that concern can be there sometimes. Um, and that's great to see most most of you um, or 41 percent of you, you know, you avoid killing bees at all costs. You know, that, that's really important. That That's the sort of thing that, you know, the whole of the industry, you know, the whole of the world really wants to see happening is that, you know, you avoid it at all costs. Um, uh, some of you as well, I advise like you can humanely remove them. So 13 percent of you um, say that you yourself um, can humanely remove them. So that's great. I think maybe three, four, five years ago, um, there was very few um, uh, companies out there that had the skills, the experience to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, having having sort of 13 percent of you being able to remove them, that, that's brilliant. Hopefully we can increase that number. Um, and and 52 percent of you, the biggest number, which I was I expected, uh, would be that you advise that they call a beekeeper. Um, you can get different variations in terms of what beekeepers can say that they can do. Um, usually it's just swarms, but some of them maybe have got more skills to be able to remove them from you know, cavities or, or trees, etc. Um, OK, so the third one, do you always kill wasp nests when called upon? Um, so 52 percent of you, yes, 48 percent of you, no. Real even split there. Um, and it, it might form a little bit of the questions going forward, but, um, you know, wasp nests, they need to be dealt with. They need to be dealt with. Of course they do. But, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I've got a neighbour and I can see um, wasps starting to come in and out quite actively now. Um, it's a bit of um, fun for me during the day anyway. And I'm sitting out having a, a PIMS or something. I do have PIMS. Um, you know, watching them. It's the sadly um, entertainment for me. And, you know, I haven't told them about it. It's not bothering them. They don't have a window nearby and um, they, they know what I do. So hopefully they'll call upon me if they feel it needs um, dealing with. Get one of our members to sort it. So, yeah, it's just a really thing to consider. Do you always need to kill a wasp nest when called upon? Um, something to think about. And the last one here. So do you think wasp call outs have increased in the last five years? 22% um, of you said yes a lot. Um, 
of 9% of you feel that they have decreased. Um, again, it would probably vary area to area. You know, some I'm up in Yorkshire. Um, you know, maybe we get more wasps nests up here than maybe we're down in the south. But actually, it's probably around the other way, most likely. Whereas one year, it could be a lot busier. Um, I remember in 2010 being a particular year. Um, that's 10 years ago. It's scary, isn't it? Um, but yeah, 2010, I remember there being a real massive decline in 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 wasp nests. I think we we the company I worked for at the time, um, a local authority, we 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 must have gone from an average of you know 800 calls a year to probably about 30. I mean, it was that drastic. That that was in Yorkshire. Um, it was just really dramatic, and there was lots of opinions on why that might be. Um, but I think yeah, we've, it's been quite steady lately. So um, so yeah. That's the poll then. I am going to take the sharing off there. And I am going to share my screen and a bit of, I say a presentation. It's more of a, I'm going to pop up six questions. Um, let's start from the beginning here. Scott will let me know if anything's not looking right, apart from how slow the computer is today. I think a few of you have put some uh, questions in the Q&A bit already, so hopefully we will we'll certainly get to that. Okay, so, so um, as a technical team special, um, just, just some questions to get you thinking, you know, some of these questions that I'm going to come up with, you may have already um, thought of yourself. You might go, brilliant, Natalie, you've just uh, um, answered something I was thinking the other day. So let me, you never know. Um, we've, done, we've done the poll already, so I'll skip that side there. So this is one of the questions, there's an awful six of these, the questions that I got through um, last week and decided, yeah, actually, they're really good questions, let's put them out, so I'm sure most people have thought about it. So, if all other options have been explored and a risk assessment requires a bumblebee nest uh, to be destroyed, how can we do this? Um, and right there, suppliers are you know, reluctant to recommend the product given the controversial topic. And, and so are we in terms of, you know, products I mean, we, we generally don't um talk or recommend any specific product we'll always say to you um you know, speak to suppliers and, and they can advise you about it however my first response to this question is bumblebee nests should not be destroyed also i know the question is if all other options are explored and risk assessment requires it um but i would have a discussion of what is causing it to be needing that lethal treatment? Um, you know, where is it? Why is it there? Well, why can't it be removed? Um, you know, bumblebees generally, there's lots of different species, and you know, but generally they kind of nest in you know soft soils or possibly bits of trees, um, and sometimes they can get into our cavities. So rare. I mean, it's so rare that I come across a, a bumblebee nest in um, you know an air vent, but it can happen, of course, and I think this question is related to that kind of scenario where um, an, an entrance or exit to a building um, has a, an air vent, for example, or a gap that, that leads into the cavity and, and bees have set up home there. Now, you know, bees are generally non-aggressive. Non Some species, I think, like dream bees apparently can be a little bit more active and um, excited to see, shall we say. Um, but you know, they're very um, aggressive and, you know, in terms of choosing a chemical treatment is, is, is absolutely down the bottom of the list it shouldn't it should not even really be considered you know the removal of it if they if that bumble business is such a problem where it is then the investment needs to be given to remove it without killing it and relocating it um in the in the you know again i'm not going to talk about products that's you know your suppliers um you know getting in touch with them keeping in contact with them in terms of what you can use um the freezing products that, that lady spoke about a moment ago and other suppliers you know have access to them whether or not they have um you know i had a little look at the label like you know it said for treatment of pretty much all insects um possibly if you had to if you really felt you had to um, destroy a bumblebee's nest, maybe something like that, you know, that's non-toxic could be used. But again, you need to read the label and speak to suppliers and check. But, you know, my absolute and BBC's absolute stance is we just can't see why a bumblebee nest would need to be destroyed. They get up to 500 individuals in there, generally no more than that. So, you know, very low numbers, you know, 
you bumble around as the name suggests um and yeah it's you know i think it's something to really really hold back from um if you do have something and you're really convinced that you you need to kill this lethally then give one of us a ring you know have, have a chat to us so you're still not happy about it maybe take some photographs of it or some film footage of it or where it is and you know pop it over to us um you know on on, on, a, on email or whatsapp or other platforms available we'll have a little look and then we can have a conversation about it because it's really important that we you know we absolutely avoid it and that goes for honeybees as well uh, but this question was specifically for um bumblebees okay um so on to the next one the more i get stung by wasps the reaction gets worse is this normal um again this really important question because that that's exactly it we assume with um you know we can assume and i certainly assumed in the early days um, when I started in pest control is that if I got stung by a wasp or the more that I got stung, the less maybe the reaction would be. And, you know, I wouldn't really need to worry about having any kind of, you know, severe allergic reaction. Whereas actually the opposite is true. So the more that we get stung, um, the less um, ability we have to deal with that sting and therefore the reaction to the toxins that they pump into us can be worse. Um, you know, and this this question was this is exactly as it was written on the webinar last week, and it's a really important one because you know this can be some severe health and safety risks associated with just one sting. You don't need multiple, of course. You know, the more stings you get, the the, the more severe the reaction could be, and um, you know, severe injury. But you know, it can be just one wasp sting. Um, so yeah, if you're a technician or you're a manager, or employer, employee make sure that each year at the beginning of say a wasp season um you know you're asking these questions you're saying right getting everybody together you know and if it's if you're on your own just asking yourself right okay you know how did i react the last time i got stung um is there anything you know you can do to try and um counter out obviously these things like pp of course you know you your wasp suits um, i found that sometimes multiple layers help although in this kind of hot weather was you know is, is quite um unattractive to, to to do but you know really important to protect yourself um and then if there's any you know if you've got any employees or it's yourself and you're really worried about actually you know my reactions got worse last week last year um and i'm worried about it this year then go and speak to your gp because you know you don't want to you know just think oh it'll be fine because it, it may not you know we we can react and we need to you know we need to take it worst case scenario sometimes because that's how you protect yourself and how you protect your employees um so so sit down if you've got employees sit down with them beginning of the season and have a chat about wasps see if anybody's got any concerns any any changes in their reaction and then you can address that as well and make sure the ppe is all you know um really really intense ppe check beforehand you know rips can happen in you know hoods or parts of the suits uh, make sure you know they've got you know two pairs of overalls maybe so that if you've know, got a particularly active wasp nest um, you can get a couple of layers on so yeah really important that you know realize that wasp stings will, will can and will get worse rather than better Okay, um, so would it become dangerous to leave a honeybee nest in a house wall cavity if became very large? As I said, I've literally copy and pasted these questions on there. I haven't changed the uh, the um, grammar at all. Um, and, and said, that, you know, the, the talking about honeybees was a really big subject last week, and it is a very big subject, and I can't go through all of it now. For any of you that weren't on it last week, you know, you might want to be talk about this subject a lot more. Um, you know, we've had uh, the last forum that we've done, we had um, Bee, Bee Gone, one of our members who removes bees, um, honeybees from cavities, and they've done a good talk about it. And, you know, they, as well as myself last week, went into the complications of, you know, why treating honeybees with chemicals is a real, you know, I a no, no, and, and don't do it unless you really, really have to. And even if you have to, you know, the likeness of it being effective because of the way the hives are structured within cavities can you know be very tricky to actually do what you want to do and then you've got all these chemicals that they're not doing much um but in terms of you know if you if you were to you know um have a honey bees nest and let's say that the bees left for some reason or the environment became um unsavory for them they left that nest and the honey behind or there was um a lethal treatment that went ahead and was successful and, and killed all those bees you just got to imagine what's left behind because this is the other issue with you know not removing um humanely a, a bee honeybee colony is that 
you know, you've got honey left behind, you've got wax cells left behind, you've got larvae left behind. So that larvae, I mean, you know, honeybee nests, depending on how long they've been there, you can get up to, you know, 50,000 individuals and you can imagine how many um, that queen within that nest, how many eggs and larvae may be in there. So if suddenly there's nothing to look after those larvae, of course, they're going to die. And then what does rotting larvae smell like? Pretty bad. Um, so you've got things like that to consider that that smell will go on for some time. Um, honey, you know, has been found in Egyptian tombs. It can last for forever, it seems, you know, thousands of years. So, you know, that honey within the cavity of that property is not going anywhere, apart from maybe running, running down the walls um, or maybe getting into places where you don't want it. Um, and also possibly attracting, um, you know, other bees or um insects and they may try and rob it as well and then you've got that complication of obviously making sure it's all sealed up because if you treat a honeybee's nest with the uh, chemical and you get some robber bees in there and the wrong people find out then you know there's some serious consequences involved with that um so you need to you know to think about that and also the wax cells you can get things like wax moth i'm not a real massive expert on the different types of insects you can get within a honeybees nest but certainly you know moth species feeding on that that um, uh, nest that's been left behind and um, possibly a, a variety of different beetles that can cause infestations so you know you've got bad smells you've got extra insects infestations and you've got that honey that's left there i mean we, we farm honeybees because they create more honey than they need and that's so they can overwinter and um and, and survive off of it while they're not foraging and actually creating new honey and so there's a lot of honey in there um you know depending on the size of the nest but even if it's just a you know a jar full if you like that's that's a, a lot of honey to be you know dripping down not getting tended to um and then possibly um getting in places you don't want it in properties and cleaning up cleaning up honey is uh, probably as you can imagine quite a tricky job so yeah it i say can it become dangerous it can certainly become cause a lot more problems it can cause a lot of horrible smells and obviously insects um and possibly because of the structure there, wax is actually quite flammable. So that wax that they use there, if you've got a honeybee's nest in a chimney or anywhere near where the heat could increase or there could be a spark, then absolutely, you know, it's very flammable and you could have some problems related to that. So could be dangerous in, a, in you know, very few circumstances do I know of, but um, it's there, wax is there, it's flammable. That's why we use it for, for candles, it's very good at that. And again, possibly that wax melting um okay so um carrying on i think i'm doing okay for the time yeah absolutely um so in terms of wasp nest if treating a wasp nest within an attic how can we do it safely um and i think th th this question has come from the the fact obviously things like ficam d is very much um less used obviously because of the external um, part of the label being taken off um you know, and other products are, are being in place. So, you know, maybe we're actually considering treating wasp nests from within an attic, um, just so that, you know, some of these indoor use only products can be used. Um, I mean, I always found it, you know, if you can see a wasp nest um, in an attic, I personally always found, yeah, I, I wanted to get as close to that, get the insecticide in directly to the nest as tightly and as cleanly as possible. You know, it's always found treating from outside, you'd have that residue um, on the outside of the tiles. And that's the problem with Ficam D is that, you know, you can in theory still use Ficam D if you're standing outside, but you have to make sure that product is going into the building. If there is any chance whatsoever that Ficam D dust is gonna lie on a, on a tile you know we, we know it when we used to say with, with the wasps you know as they came in and out of that nest they would pick up that dust and then take it in further for us that's an absolute no-no if i can do so you know really it's not being used anymore um because we can't really ensure that that's not going to happen so maybe getting into an attic would be a good idea you can get you know if you can see it and it's right there and you can get direct access to it it'd probably be a really straightforward um, hundred percent sure that you're gonna gonna kill the nest because it is there and you can you can see the structure of it. The things you do need to obviously consider are the health and safety implications. So you know if you've got an attic that's got um, no safety boarding down at all, then of course you can't treat it from in the attic. It's just unsafe to do so. You know not only could you damage your customer's property if you were to fall through, um, but obviously it's going to be a you know it could cause injury. Um, and, and obviously with the nature of wasp nests, um, you've got to think about the, the um, 
the, the tackle that they may have or they may come towards you and may startle you a bit and of course there's more chance you're going to put your foot somewhere you shouldn't and, and go through the roof so you know if there's no boarding then you don't do it um, if there is and it seems safe to get up and walk around um you may want to also think about these are just things that I, I want to give you to sort of food for thought is it great you've got a stable surface now you can see the nest what about your ppe so of course you have you need to wear a mask because you're going to, especially you're in a confined space with possibly an insecticide that you're using, if it is, you know, a toxic insecticide. Um, but also you'll have a veil on. Now we think about, you know, being in an attic with a veil on, it's going to be dark because generally you don't want to turn that light on because then the wasps are possibly going to come straight for you. The normal process is to put a torch, you know, that's on further away from you. So if any wasps do come out and they want to follow a light, they're going to go over there and leave you alone. Um, so, you know, generally the lighting's not great, um, apart from that torch that's shining towards the nest, obviously give you direction, but you've got that, that um, veil on. So, you know, you're going to be restricted on where you can see, you know, whether you can see up and down and each side. So you need to make sure that, um, you know, you're considering these things before you think about going into an attic. Have you got a veil that's got good all round vision and that it's not restrictive in terms of, of movement? Um, because also you're probably gonna have to have a bump cap under that as well. Because you know, most attics and this you're in a particularly large property, um, you know, will have will have beans kind of crossing over everywhere and there's a good chance you're gonna gonna hit your head. So you're gonna need um a hard hat on. So, you know, we've got a hard hat on, we've got um we've got uh, a face mask on, we've got our um uh veil on as well. So, you know, again, all of you are gonna be able to picture that and imagine what you know what it's like in terms of how you can navigate yourself safely um, and then you've got to make a decision whether that is something that you want to do if you feel safe and you feel yep yeah, our, our, our equipment is suited to be able to make sure that, that we're safe then great um, but the other really important thing you've got to think about once you've you know, made sure you're protected against you know wasp stings and falling and um, you know stepping on somewhere you shouldn't go through the roof um you know you need to think about your exit so you know when you're treating this nest there needs to be no sudden need to exit that attic because that's dangerous you know you've got one way in one way out normally and normally it's from through a hatch you know and a ladder so you need to make sure um that you're happy with your processes um with your health and safety and your confidence in you know treating the nest um usually quite quick knockdown treatments are, are best for treating in an attic i find um just because you know because some of the powders or um, sprays that are used it, it might take you know hours minutes you know um to actually start affecting that insect whereas if you can get a fast knockdown product that you can use you know possibly aerosols then you're less likely to maybe be um accosted by lots of wasps trying to defend themselves you know those, those quick knockdowns um can be good but of course they normally come with you know um quite strong odors and you know really important that you have your your, your mask on and your ppe um protecting yourself against that but fast knockdown good so yeah just a general talk about you know health and safety considerations you know it can be a really great thing to do but you know it's not just a oh it's easy i'll pop up there and uh, get it done you need to think about how you're going to do it so you know having a generic risk assessment that you do at the beginning of every season you share it with everybody and say right if you're going to treat from outside this is what you need to do if you're going to treat within an attic and you feel that you know it's the best way then these are the safety precautions you need to take um, okay fabulous uh so a couple more so it's mentioned that some common dusts are no longer appropriate for outdoor use just mentioned 5md what other methods would you consider for outdoor wasp nests so you know we've talked about them in houses and you know in an attic and if you can get obviously from from inside great and if it's safe great um you know treating from outdoors yes yeah, there's there's loads um as, as lady mentioned um um rob there and i'm sure bill germ will probably touch on it later as well but you know that there's quite a few feature suppliers they you know they've got dust available um you know depending on where you do it from sometimes liquid you might want if you're going from the inside or aerosols you know it really is up to you you know to have a have a chat to them about it if you've got a wasp nest that's in a tree for example that's away from a property but it's in a you know a tree or compost heap or somewhere that you know is, is not in a property then of course you know it's got to have external use on the label and um you know it's got to have the indication that using it in those areas is, is okay just read the label that, that that's simply it um so yeah you know you can still use chemicals and obviously in terms of toxicity you know really really 
really think about actually what I'm using to treat wasps is it the least toxic I could use is there anything better do I really need to go for that you know one kills everything type of um, insecticide powder or, or, or otherwise you know just have, have a real good think about it as long as it does the job you know if you can get a low toxicity there um, then everybody's happy and, and you've, it's a great you know tool to use talking to your customers because they really then you know, really feel that care that you have and you know you're only doing this because you really need to and you know but however you're using the, the least toxic methods possible and you know the quickest um so yeah i'd make you know any products you use in there you know um consider what quantities you're putting in you know because it, it's away from a house and it's in a more you know natural environment um you could get a lot more insect species or, or other things coming into contact with it so you need to make sure that you know any treatment you do that's away from a property and a tree or a more natural environment um that you're, you're thinking about those insecticides you're using them and where you're putting them and, and keeping them safe from from other non-target species okay um we have just one more question and then i'll go on to a bit of a, a q a i think we've got about uh, 20 minutes left so that's good um so how do you deter wasps this was just a you know just the one to finish on really um in terms of deterring them um you know it <laughs> is, is is the million dollar question really um but you know we talk about things like leaving nests in situ so if you were to you know treat a wasp nest and your customer says do you look i want you to remove the nest with it um then, then the advice really is to say if you can leave it in place you know of course if you feel maybe it's in a you know, it's got a risk to maybe a fire hazard or um something like that then, then maybe maybe you would but if it's possible to leave it then then there's no no need to to remove it you know if, if we if we remove that nest we're basically creating another lovely space for a, a new wasp nest to be created next season um and also those pheromones that um and that are left behind from that wasp nest you've killed you know you'll take that wasp nest away but there'll still be residue of that nest there and that could actually actively attract wasps um into a property to build a nest in its in its place so you know leaving wasp nests behind you can still get them well they'll you know it looks like they've um re-established a population in an old nest and you go oh, honestly you said that they don't you know populate old wasp nests but actually there's a good possibility that nest is just attached to the old wasp nest or nearby and it might look like um that they, they've occupied it but to this day i don't know of any um, wasp nests that have um, been repopulated by a new queen the following year um, and then you've got things you know go away from wasp nests and actually talking about areas um, around um, you know picnic areas or if you're in you know um, a care home or anywhere where people sit outside you know especially this hot weather you know we're out there you know drinking you know fruity drinks and fresh drinks and eating our sandwiches out there and you can get a lot of possibly activity from different species of insects but you know certainly possibly wasps and as we go later in the season definitely wasps um so you know if it's a possibility in these areas you can put things like um uh, pots around that have a sweet substance at the bottom of that pot that actually will attract wasps so rather than coming to you they'll go oh, i'll go and see what's in that pot over there um they'll fly in and get trapped and of course that will keep then the numbers down around that area where you don't want them um, and also cutting cutting um, any bushes down that might be attracting them. The the, the worker wasps actually feed on um, uh, like insects. So um, aphids a lot of the time they catch them in flight, chop off their um, the, their wings with their quite strong mandibles, um, and then take them back to feed to the larvae. So um, yeah, this is a great benefit of wasps. This is this is great for a gardener because obviously you know you've got some pests there that might be you know doing their tomatoes in or you know preventing something from growing whereas wasps will you know help with clearing up you know these pest species insects you know they're feeding on them um but if you you know if you've got an area where they're particularly active around a certain bush it's possibly because you know they're getting a lot of food source from that so maybe you know um you can cut that bush down move it away if not then um possibly try some of these wasp pots that you can get so a few different ways you can deter them but if there's no nest and they're just generally in an area you need to try and attract them away from that area with something or possibly remove what they might be or look like they'll be feeding on um that's the best way okay fabulous so we've got sort of 10 10 minutes left or so um for some questions i've only got five that's popped up there um just as a quick reminder we have something a new um uh, discussion group coming up called member huddles and it's for 
smaller um, groups of people to come together, maybe sort of 20 or 30, probably a bit less actually. Um, and, and rather in this today, I can't see you. Um, you know, none of the presenters can see you, um, but you can hear us and see us. Whereas actually with these member huddles, everyone will be able to see everybody. It's a discussion about certain topics. So I think some of you might be interested in that. There's a few um, topics we've got, um, advertising and marketing we're doing, um, COVID-19, um, some furlough and HR considerations as well for any um, business owners that are interested in that. Um, I'm doing one on some bee con conservation and also bird conservation um, and, and yeah, CPD and there's lots of different events there. So have a have a little look at that, you know, maybe because you get more involved, you see, you can get your face on there and have a, have a talk. Ne really important that you're willing to do that as well. So um, confidence is needed. OK, I am going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, OK. So five questions, that's good. Okay, so we should get through those easily. Um, okay, so it depends on the species of bee and circumstances. We collect swarms for our own hives or give to other local beekeepers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in terms of you know removing bumblebees or, or honeybees, um, you know, it can depend on the species. Um, you know, again, if you if you some do say that tree bee species can be a little bit more, more aggressive. Again, I'm you know. There may not be, but some people refer to them being a little bit more aggressive. And if you feel they need to be removed, um, then obviously do so or, or even treat it. But that is a decision not to come too lightly. Um, and again, you know, you might have the opportunity to think, actually, I could collect some of these for my own benefit. You know, an old uh, colleague of mine I used to work with, used to collect bumblebees nests and put them down the bottom of his garden and just sit there with a cup of tea most mornings watching them. You know, it's a quite a... You know, it's, yeah, it, it's um, a very nice um, hobby to have. So, um, but yeah, that was just a, a comment there by um, David. Thank you. Um, OK, so bumblebees, I've tried to relocate a couple of nests in the last few weeks. OK, great. I'm pretty sure the queen would be in the mass that I collect in a bag and hopefully a few of the workers. Do you think the relocation is likely to be successful? If you have got the queen, Yes, obviously, you know, not just the queen on her own and off you go and leave all the workers behind. But yeah, if you've got a, um, a substantial amount of the workers along with the queen, then then absolutely. Um, that's the most important thing. You know, if you had a big bag of workers and um, no queen, then it would do, you know, they would all just um, eventually succumb to nature and, and die off. Whereas, yeah, if you've got a queen and some workers, absolutely, um, that will be successful. Um, OK, so will diatomaceous earth kill wasps or just it, does it take them, get, make them angry? Oh, anything makes wasps angry, I think, you know, just going up and having a look at them can make them angry. Many a time, you know, kind of having some choice words for wasps. I thought, I'm just looking at you, you know, stop, stop attacking me. Probably because they knew what I was going to be doing. But um, uh, but yeah, absolutely. Any any disturbance of a wasp nest with anything, you know, a stick or you know, chemical, it's going to make them you know, upset and each nest will have their their own um, temperaments, um, again, from experience. Um, but yeah, it will it will kill them. Of course it will. Um, it will take longer um, because of the nature of the way it does it, that it removes that waxy layer and they die of um, a loss of, of moisture. Um, it will take more time than, say, an aerosol, of course. But yeah, if you, you know, if you can, you know, use something like that, that's always preferable. Um, but always make sure you still wear PPE of diatomaceous earth because even though you know it's non-toxic and it's natural, you know it's a dust and actually, you know, to breathe it in is not a good thing. Um, you know, the very, very, very small particles. So um, you know, if you're using it and pumping it, it's very flowable, as we all know. And um, you know, we, we need to be wearing um, you know masks when you're you know pumping that into anywhere. You don't want to be breathing it in. Um, so for external dining tables, etc., there is also a wasp repellent um, called wasp guard. Not sure how good it is. Again, a, a comment there. Yep. So there's, you know, there's going to be a few um, options out. They get wasp bags as well. You know, if you've got an area that's particularly busy with wasps, you know, you can get a thing that catches in a bag. Um, you know, things are, you know, new products are coming out all the time. You know, if uh, the suppliers and manufacturers feel there's something you guys want, I think they'll try their hardest to get it for you. So. Um, but yeah, great, Graham. Thank you for that. I think there are a few products out there. 
Um, over what maximum distance should the relocation be made and what time of day? Oh, good question, Peter. Well, this will make Tony feel better. Is that I, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, I would imagine, you know, I mean, you're going to take it. I would think, you know, at least a, a couple of miles away. I can't believe you'll be that lucky. You're always going to have something nearby to the original location of that nest. Um, um, but, I'd, you know, I'd imagine it doesn't really matter. Normally you've got that queen, um, those workers, and you're, you're putting it in a new location they'll stay there you know they'll they'll okay they'll have to you know re-establish themselves and have a look at where they're going and what their you know where their food source is but yeah they'll re-establish um okay so we've got another so are bumblebees important to the environment of course they are yeah so maybe i didn't talk about that a lot and obviously time restrictions as well but yeah bumblebees are very very important to um the environment the ecosystem in terms of what they do um i mean wasps also wasps actually pollinate as well they're not you know to be completely discounted but bees are very effective pollinators um they actually have when you see them flying around um your, your plants if you have a good look at them you'll see they've got a um a, like a little pollen basket you know and they've got two big sacks of pollen on the side of them and um yeah absolutely through that collection that process of them collecting it they're then transferring those fertile pollens from plant to plant and that's what's actually making those plants be able to um increasing numbers so really important so yeah absolutely they are they are um okay one more question uh so often refer bumblebees to the bumblebee conservation trust website yep great david um good thing to do i think i mentioned that yeah last week on the webinar i had a link on there so the bumblebee conservation trust loads of useful information some good identification charts so if you get a customer wanting you to deal with a bumblebee nest then you know identify it first because you can identify it learn a bit about the species and then when you're speaking to the customer you may even be able to get to the point where you know they don't want it treated anymore um and you know you've successfully you know saved a, a bumblebee nest so great place to go um just as i was talking there just one more came in um from david i have a honeybees nesting in my chimney breast what can be done as the building as a listed building i mean a, yeah listed building of course you've got to speak to the relevant um organization to be able to ask them to be you know um obviously if you can remove it that's the best thing i've moved removed a honeybees nest from a chimney from below before i think the chimney breast went into a bedroom that was um, you, you can see where the chimney breast was and um, we actually we used a, a smoke generator unfortunately this was 10-15 years ago um, to, to deal with them of course there was then a redundant nest um, and then we managed to sort of knock a hole through the bottom of the chimney look up and we could see all the cone hanging down um, and we were able to, to knock it all out but if you're going to be doing work like that or even from above you know even if you're going to put a screw into the wall if it's a listed building you need to get the relevant um permissions from the relevant authority or, or organization so um yeah have a have a look into that david okay that's all the questions and i think we are yeah sort of five minutes just uh ahead of time um oh uh no we've done that one there i'll close the questions down and yeah i will say thank you to everybody for, for listening today hopefully some of those um, questions that came up has, has, has helped you out and thought well, actually yeah, I was thinking about that the other day if not then apologies <laughs> but yeah give, give us a ring any questions that you do have that may have popped into your mind now after this talk that I haven't addressed maybe but it might have um, sort of started up that thinking process and give us a call always talk about it don't sort of sit there and think well I'm not sure the answer to that and well, I'll go ahead anyway give us a call talk to someone about it um, you know it's always good to bounce off like that um, yes excellent okay so this is brings us to the end of the first session first speakers um i believe scott are you happy for us to take a break now uh, yeah that sounds good so let's have a break and meet back at five past eleven five past so 15 11. minutes 15 minutes break thank you everybody and we'll see you soon Hello there, welcome back everybody.
I was about to say good afternoon then, but we're not quite there yet, are we? So good morning still. Um, hopefully you've all got a bit of caffeine or water or green tea, whatever it is that you decided to grab yourself um, and get ready for our next couple of speakers coming up. And um, we just saw in some of the comments during the beginning of my talk, there was a few technical problems. I didn't realise since Scott was keeping an eye on it, I think sorted it out for you. So again, I'll say what's got you. Know, thank you for bearing with us. Um, these things can happen sometimes. So yeah, again, any other problems going forward, just uh, just let the chat area know and Scott will try and help you out. Great, okay, so coming up then, we've got um, a, a slot from uh, Kill Germ Chemicals, our sponsors today, um, doing some a fantastic talk on Ficom W and what the alternatives may be. Um, Rob Simpson is uh, the guy we'll be getting to know now and having a chat about um, what those alternatives are. So if I could ask you to um, unmute and share your screen, that would be amazing. Hi, Robert. Hi. Good morning, Hi. everyone. I'll leave you to it. Thank you very much. I hope every I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I shall try the uh, the joys of screen sharing, um, and hopefully all will be good. And that should be exactly what you need to see. Hi, my name's Rob. Um, nice to speak to you all. Um, very odd speaking to people without ever getting anything back, um, but it's something that we're all getting used to. Um, I am here with tamed. Uh, corona hair and slightly tamed corona beard, but I put a tie on especially for you all um, and then realised it's the hottest day of the year. So uh, I'm just sat here sweating whilst I talk to you, worrying about my first talk to the BPCA audience. Um, so hello. Um, I'm here to talk to you really about FICAM W or rather what are we going to do without FICAM W. So I'll give you a brief uh, overview um, of, uh, of FICAM's history. It's a much loved and used residual insecticide um, and the alternatives that are now available to you. And I think it should link in quite nicely to some of the talks that you've had earlier on this morning and perhaps some of the ones this afternoon, because as we said, uh, this afternoon, later on after me, um, because there's, there's a very definite uh, insect bent to this, uh, to this sets of presentations. Um, right then, so FICAM W, everybody should know. It's been going biggest news for the, over the last six months, the loss of um, a FICAM W. All insecticides, uh, they're going through the new uh, biocidal products regulations, the BPR process, which we know about, but everything is going to be going through that process. And that's leading to changes um, in products. Um, so for example, FICAM D, uh, we spoke about earlier on, and the use inside and outside um, as the labels change. Um, but it could cause a loss of some products, and the biggie that it has, uh, it has caused a loss of is FICAM W. It failed to meet the requirements of the biocidal product regulations. Uh, you can, as of now, no longer purchase FICAM W. Sorry, I cannot sell it to you. Um, the use update is the 10th of December. So everything that you have on your stocks, um, you need to use up by the 10th of December. After that date, you need to dispose of safely. So I thought we'd give you a, a brief history of, uh, of FICAM W for those that may have met Lawrence, uh, my counterpart. Um, his history of FICAM W is far longer than mine uh, because he's rather a FICAM W fan. Um, it was first commercialized in the UK in 1974. Um, at that time, most of the other insecticides out there were liquids with very uh, pungent solvent bases, um, but Bendiacarb, is very difficult to dissolve in solvents. So it was formulated as a, as a wettable powder. And in 1974, this was something that was very new. Um, it was a very novel concept. Um, and the industry in general didn't pick up on it um, as, as we do on new products these days. It was, it was considered all new and a little bit weird. Um, so Fison's was set up their own pest control, pest control company, predominantly to use FICA. Uh, and that company was so successful the industry took interest and FICAM just rolled on from then. And it has, FICAM W has remained one of the most popular products on the market. In my own personal experience, I've been in the, the industry for 18 years, um, other than potentially, I think the crew regulations uh, and the changes that came in, the FICAM loss is, is one of the, the, the big changes to the, uh, to the industry. And, and as a single product um, that, everybody uses to some degree, I think it's the, the, the biggest effect. 
And why does everybody use FICAM W? Why is it so popular? And I should point out, different people use it in very different ways. Uh, but it can be used on a wide range of insects. Pretty much every insect out there is on the FICAM W label. It can be used in a wide range of places, that's locations and on objects. Um, so you can use it on mattresses and furnishings. Uh, I think Tony mentioned it um, earlier on before, but you can use it in pretty much every um, location going. It's got a good residual life. Um, it, 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 it doesn't leave any odour or marks of stains. And I should caveat that if dosed and sprayed as per the label instruction. For those people out there that think it's a wise idea to triple bag, um, not good with FICAM. Um, it is not a very good thing to do at all. Uh, I've seen it happen and it leaves, leaves a problem and this contravenes all the label instructions. Uh, it is excellent on porous um, and it's very good on, on non-porous surfaces. Um, so you can use it on all sorts of different uh, surfaces. It's easy to dose and mix. Uh, the, the sachets are obviously slightly more expensive than the jars, um, but very easy to mix. Um, putting that the sachet in a five litre um, tub and then fill it with water, job done. And many pest controllers have a five litre sprayer of five cam pretty much on the go all summer long. There's uh, there's little wastage with it. It's constantly refreshed. Um, it, it's constantly uh, uh, updated. You should use it all up before you put anything more in. But that FICAM W just keeps going and going and going because you can use it in all the different situations that you're looking at across. Um, and it was owned and made by a trusted manufacturer. This is, uh, this is also very useful. We know that it works. So what do we do now? Simple answer, there is no direct alternative on the market to FICAM W. Um, I've been asked the question, thousands of times um, my stock response now is what is a replacement to five gram w the answer is your brain um, you're going to have to think about things uh, and decide which is the best product because there isn't a one size fits all answer and we're going to have to use different products in different scenarios um, it's actually it's technically far more effective to use uh, different products uh, and methods for the pests and areas that you're treating um, so it, it is good for the industry in that way. You will be far more effective rather than using the one product as a, as a, a standpoint. So how do you pick an alternative? How do I choose? Um, well, first off, let's look at why you like FICAM W. What, what are you using FICAM on? Um, where are you using it most? Um, and what do you need on the label? Like I said, no, there's no, no one product that can answer all those questions. Um, so you're looking at a, a, a combination um, or a series of, of different answers. So why do we love FICAM? Broad spectrum label. It can be used on most insects in most areas, all soft furnishings, mattresses. It's cost effective to use. Um, the jar works at about £5.50 a litre, uh, per five litre, I should say. Sachets, um, a bit more expensive, that's £6.49 per five litre. I should point out that um, I'm going to go through some sort of cost um, variances uh, uh, throughout this. These are our uh, catalogue prices um, that I have used, um, uh, so, so to give you an idea. And I've started to look at not just the amount that it costs per five litre sprayer, um, which is interesting as a, um, as a comparison, but also taking into account the application rates because different products have different application rates. So I've put on there um, cost per meter squared as well, just to give you an idea of how these things can differ. Um, it's got a good residual time, um, average about four to six weeks, um, which is why it's very, very popular. And again, good on porous, non-porous surfaces. And it really does work. It's effective. It rarely fails to solve the issue. I um, mean, partly that's its its downfall. Maybe perhaps too effective. So alternatives to um, FICAM W. Um, so I've kept one side. There you've got the 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 the, the, the FICAM W sort of reasons for using it. And then I'm going to go through a whole series of products that are out there um, that we sell. Um, and as a 
what, what, what they can do in, in comparison to FICAM public. So the first one I want to look at uh, is k and Partix. And this is um, uh, the new Bayer product. It's uh, all been approved through the uh, BPR. Um, so one of the things we should say with this one is we know that we've got it for nine years now um, before it has to go through the BPR again. It has um, a large range of pests on the label, um, which is very, very useful. Um, it includes um, outdoor wasp nest, um, which sort of is handy um, in, in from light of what we've just been discussing um, about um, FICAM D. There are a large range of treatment areas. Um, you can use it in lots and lots of different areas, and it can be used on mattresses and furniture. Um, so you don't have to use different products for, 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 for uh, different surfaces. It's good on both porous and non-porous surfaces. Um, it's residual, um, which is very useful. It's got low active levels, uh, low um, of the levels of the active ingredient, um, which uh, it's actually for the technical amongst you, it's held up by a, a, a high sort of wax globule content that's in there that keeps it on the top of the surface. So there is low active ingredient that comes in contact with more insects, um, which is why uh, it, it got through the BPR absolutely no problem at all. And it makes it much more environmentally friendly. Um, and now as a cost comparison, 4.95 for a five litre, um, so a little bit cheaper, um, but 4.9 um, pence per meter squared, so 0.5 of a P um, more expensive per meter square. Now the downsides of this, you can't treat outside of it, you, uh, other than treating it directly into an outdoor wasp nest, um, it, it can't be sprayed outside. Um, but the days of um, spraying large areas uh, of insecticide outside, I remember when, the, when, when I first started and the idea of treating ants was to put a, a band of insecticide all the way around buildings and that would just sort the ants for the season. Um, it's not really the dumb thing anymore. Um, the labels have moved on considerably since then. So then we'll look at the, uh, the Citrol 40, the C40 um, that uh, Tony was talking about, a uh, large range of pests. Um, it's a large range of uh, treatment areas. Uh, it can be used on furniture. Um, it's good on both the porous and the non-porous uh, surfaces. Um, it is a residual, which is, is very convenient. Uh, and the uh, mixing solution um, on the sachets is very similar to the uh, to the 5MW. Because it is a wettable powder, it's done in exactly the same way. So loose, it is cheaper. Um, as you can see there, 326 per five litre uh, or 2.6p per metre squared. This is for the Citrol Forte, uh, loose. Um, now, if you go to the sachets, so the easy mix option, this is more expensive per five litre um, and per uh, metre squared. Um, so, but it, it, it's still less than the, the, the thigh cam. Um, however, one of the downsides cannot be stored in a sprayer. Um, you can't leave this in your sprayer overnight. You have to finish it off on every job. Um, it is written down there on the label. You can't take it to the next job. It, it is, it, well, maybe to the next job. You can't do it overnight. Um, that can lead to more wastage um, because you will just use, keep using it until it's run out. That's Otherwise, you're going to have to find a way of disposing it, and that's more tricky than just using it. Um, and the other downside, it can't be used on mattresses. So unlike the 5 cam, you can't put it on the mattress. You've got to think of some other option out there for, um, for use on mattresses. Symmetrol Super, the next one to have a look at. This is a bit of a, a, a big daddy of an insecticide. There's got many active ingredients in it, large range of pests, large range of treatment areas. Um, it can be used on furniture. Um, it's a fast acting emulsion, so it's got a quick knockdown, it's got residual and then long term residual with, uh, with IGRs, the insect growth regulators. Um, but again, downside, it can't be stored in a sprayer, so that leads to wastage. Um, and if you have a look at the bottom bit there, it's expensive. Um, like I said, there's a lot of active ingredients in there that goes into Symmetrol. Um, seven pounds uh, for a five litre or seven P per, per metre squared. Um, 
can't be used on mattresses. Really don't want to touch a mattress with that one. Um, and it's not for uh, porous surfaces. Um, it's uh, the, the, the non-porous surfaces uh, is where it's far, far more effective. So we'll have a look at the next product, um, Effect Ultimum. Uh, this one can be used on a large range of pests, on a large range of treatment areas, which is good. Can be used on furniture. Um, it's got a quick knockdown with a synergized uh, residual. Um, as, a, as far as the cost comparison, per five litre, um, you can see there are two cost comparisons that are on there. For the non-porous surfaces, it's relatively cheap. Um, it's three pound sixty-two per five litre, or three pound uh, three point six p per metre square. However, it has a different um, dosage rate on porous surfaces, um, so you have to pay close attention to the label, and it, it becomes um, more uh, uh, more costly uh, on on a porous surface. And perhaps when you're trying to mix it up together or in one site that's got a combination of different surfaces, that's going to cause you some uh, some, some problems. Um, it can't be stored in spray, as I said. Uh, it cannot be used on the mattresses, um, and we've got those different dosage rates um, that we need to take into account. Um, now, the effect Microsec. Um, CS, uh, large range of treatments areas, it can be used on furniture. Um, it's got a quick knockdown with a synergized residual. This thing has up to six months uh, residual nature due to the micro encapsulation uh, that's involved. Um, very cost effective on non porous surfaces. Uh, you'll see uh, £1.86 for a five litre, 1.8p per metre squared on non porous. But it can't be stored in the sprayer, so we've got potential wastage issues. Uh, cannot be um, used on mattresses. Um, different dosage rates for the porous and non-porous. Um, actually, on porous surfaces, it goes up to nine pound thirty for um, a five litre, um, or um, and the uh, and the application rate is nine point three p per metre square, and it doesn't have flying insects um, on the label. Uh, it only has crawling insects on there. So that's something where you, you specifically want uh, something with a really long-term residual effect, and that's where it's going to be most beneficial. Um, then into the, 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 the VASA products. Um, we've got a large range of pests on VASA cypermethrin, uh, large range of treatment areas. It can be used on furniture. And then if you look at the, uh, the, the cost, um, you've got £1.17 per five litre or 0.7p per meter square um, so this is um, considerably um, more cost effective option if that's what you're looking for but it can't be used on mattresses and it's only for non-porous surfaces indoors um, you can use some porous outdoors but uh, it's only for uh, so you use a non-porous outdoors but only for non-porous surfaces indoors Cypermax Plus, Vasa Cypermax Plus um, large range of pests, large range of treatment areas, residual on non-porous surfaces. It can be used on furniture. Um, cost effective in that it's £2.26 per 5 litre, 1.1 p per metre squared. But you can't use it on mattresses. Uh, and it's not as effective on porous surfaces. It can be used on them, but it's not as effective on porous surfaces. And then we have Vasa Prevector. I've just noticed there's a slightly different picture that's on there, but never mind. Um, there's a large range of pests with Vasa Protector, huge range of pests on there, large range of treatment areas. This is not a chemical action uh, pesticide. This is a, this is a physical action. Um, so a hugely environmentally, um, I think environmentally friendly option is, is, is one way of putting it. Um, it has very good creep into cracks and crevices. Uh, we found that to be tremendously good. Uh, and it can be used on mattresses uh, and furniture. Um, now it's £8.20 per five litre. Um, so it's, it's slightly more expensive than the other ones uh, as a five litre, but it doesn't have a set application rate. So you can adapt your application rate to the scenario uh, that you're in because it's not using a chemical action. Uh, and it's non. It's a, this is non-residual. So in comparison to FICAM, this is a non-residual product. 
I will refer you to a conversation I had with a customer yesterday who used it for the first time, um, actually on, their, and, and on a, a wasp issue that he was, he was having. Um, I'll tone down his language, but uh, generally he said, well, that's an effing game changer. Um, it really is something where you need a knockdown product. That's as fast a knockdown product as, uh, as, as, as you're going to find. It's really, really good. And then Biofren 6EC, um, very little resistance to 6EC. This is a growth regulator. Um, it's very residual. Um, it can be used on mattresses um, and furniture. And this one can be tank mixed with vasoprovector. Now, a little word on, on, on tank mixing, because um, we sort of went into it earlier on today. Um, unless your supplier tells you specifically that both products can be tank mixed together, don't mix anything in a tank, uh, will be our general uh, advice. Um, make sure that you get specific permission for both products into which you are, you are mixing. Um, now, Vasoprovector and Biopren 6EC, we know that they, are, they can be tank mixed together. So that gives you the, the very, very fast knockdown um, of Provector. Um, with the long-term effects of the, uh, of the, of the growth regulator, uh, Biopin 6 cc Now, um, in comparison with FICAM, uh, Biopin 6 cc it's only four bed bugs and fleas, um, and it's got little knockdown effect on, it, on its own. Um, and as a, as a comparison, it's eight pound uh, per five litre or eight P per metre square. So that's the, okay, blind you with a whole set of science of, of, of comparisons. And these are the sort of things that you've got to take into, into um, they're all going to be running through your mind when you're thinking, well, which one shall I use? Which one, which one shall I order in before the job? Um, there are a large range of products out there that can do part of what Ficam W does for us, um, but there's no single product that can do all of it. Um, so your choice will depend on the environment as, as, as well as the pest. Um, now, people tend to have their favorites. Um, we, we all know that. This is what I think works, and this is what I'm going to use in that, in that environment. But we'll be very aware of getting stuck in a rut. Um, be ready to adapt your solution, depending on the, the, the situation in front of you. Um, and, and particularly with bed bugs, we also thinking of the, um, the resistance um, question and making sure um, that you don't end up uh, with that. In certain areas of the country, resistance is a very big issue. That said, we get asked, what would you use over and over again? Um, it's, 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 my phone goes all day, every day. What would you use? I'm using this. What would you, what would you use? That happens to me, to the other ASMs, um, sales managers in, in Kill Gym, our technical department. Um, we all get asked that question. Here's the scenario. What would you use? To a degree, our answers will differ depending on who you ask um, and our own experiences ourselves. Um, and also our interpretation of what it is that you are describing to us. Uh, there, there are what 180 people on here. If we said, all right, we've got bed bugs in a, in, a, in a hotel room, what do you use? How do you treat it? We get 180 slightly different answers. We know that. So I've tried to summarize our general feelings. There's no right or wrong here, but these are our, our general um, feelings as a, as a group from Kiljim. So as a general use insecticide, don't leave home without it. Um, back up, it's always there. Chaothrin Partix, uh, we find the, um, the, the, the best general use insecticide um, out there at the moment. That can be used on a wide range of insects. It can be used at a wide range of places. You can use it on your mattresses. You can use it on your furnishings. It's got a good residual life. It doesn't leave any odors. It doesn't leave any marks or stains, as long as you dose it correctly. Put that caveat in there. Um, it holds to porous and non-porous surfaces. It's easy to dose and mix um, in the, the new style bottle. It's made by a trusted manufacturer. Um, and we find that that one, having that in your back pocket, that all day, every day, is going to be a very useful thing for, for, for any pest controller out there. 
There are economical alternatives at the Vasa Cypermax Plus, the Vasa Cypermethrin 10, the effect products that are out there. Um, but we find the KO through Partix gives the, um, the, the, the widest range um, of general use um, in sector design. But pest specific solutions, when FICAM came in, 74, just blast it, it'll treat everything. The world is a very different place. So ants and cockroaches, how do I treat ants? How do I treat cockroaches? We would use a baiting plan rather than a general use insecticide. Um, the, 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 the baits that are out there and are widely available now uh, are, are really, really good stuff. Um, so that's the, the, the general advice that we would use. Fleas, um, Symmetrol Super uh, is, it's a, it's a bit of a daddy. Um, if it's safe to use uh, in that environment, that's very, very effective. Um, or a tank mix of Vasoprovector and Biopren 6EC. That's going to give you a very good knockdown uh, and a very good residual. Um, now, those answers go the same with bed books. Um, it's similar sort of treatment. Uh, the biggest difference being using your hands um, and your survey and getting into every last part. As um, Tony was saying earlier on with bed books, it's the, the breadth of your survey, it's the breadth of your treatment that does very well there. And we also, um, like the heat, heat and steam uh, options, um, cold as well, uh, but there's many different things that are out there um, for heat and steam, um, just as uh, Tony went through. Wasps inside, FICAM D, we're safe to do so, exactly as, uh, as Natalie was talking about earlier on. Outside, um, Chaothrin Partix has a wasp, uh, outdoor wasp use on the label. Um, which you have to remember is it's a liquid, so you end up tend to be the liquid. You're on a five liter sprayer as opposed to a big long man system. Uh, it's a new product that's uh, around me called Pybus, um, which is a natural five liter product, um, which can be used um, outside, um, which is very useful as well. Bees, I've gone through bees, don't drink wherever possible, just don't drink. Um, leave them be, let them carry on doing. If you do treat, be aware that bees don't, it's not the same as treating with the wasps. Exactly as we said before, it, the, 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 the treatment, if you treat a bee's nest in the same way that you treat a wasp nest, it doesn't work in the same way. Um, but if you very, if you really, really must do, um, the dust, the pine dust, and the bulk, then um, are, are, are possibilities that are open to you. Actually, if I can, I'll leave us at the moment as well. Site-specific solutions, so certain uh, environments that, that can be very different um, that you've got to take account and the, the labels of the sort of aircraft. Not every insecticide out there is, is approved for use um, on, on aircraft, so for those that, that do go anywhere near it and are treated with that one, um, we have the base ULD 1500 specifically um, for use on aircraft, um, and Aquapa as well um, is, uh, is, is a feasibility. Flies in waste sites, we, we, we can talk about flies in waste sites for probably about three or four days quite happily. Um, data from Vector uh, is, is proving incredibly effective. Uh, specifically on Sorry to interrupt time. you, Rob, but your, your sound's broken up a tiny bit for us um, and, and we're struggling to hear you right at the end. Um, what I'll do is I'll get um, Natalie to rejoin us and have a look at the questions. But if you can just uh, leave and rejoin and hopefully your sound will come back on oh. and you can answer your okay. questions. Sorry about that. Hi there. Yes, again, so yeah, apologies about that, guys. It's just those last few minutes. So fortunately, I think that... Uh, most of that we got in there. Um, I can see we've got five questions coming through. So um, once Rob gets back on, we'll we'll have a look at those questions. I'm certainly not going to attempt to to answer them anyway. Um, is it, I think Lee Rob is going to log back on. I think the first question actually just come through uh, um, David uh, Mark or Pyrethroid. Are they all pyrethroid based, i.e., resistant issues? I do think. Uh, oh, there's Lawrence there. Yeah, I have yeah, a, a backup a picture. Can. Just appeared, you've changed all of a sudden. <laughs> I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, I've just checked on. So I'm, hopefully, I can, while Rob's getting sorted, if um, I thought I could come in. 
That'll be, be great. Do you want me to read out the questions for you? Uh, I can see them. The, the, the resistant issues, I think we sort of covered that, to be honest with you. There is no bendiacarb on the market anymore in terms of a liquid spray. So, yes, pretty much everything gone through is all, they're all pyrethroid based. Um, so um, that needs to, um, I think he sort of covered that to be fair and using mm-hmm. even physical forms. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Cymex eradic- eradicator, the steamer, uh, especially when it comes to bed bugs uh, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I think we nailed that one. I Rob nailed that one. Can you leave Partix in the sprayer? Um, the label says the product uh, for the neck treatment uh, could be moved on basically for the neck treatment, um, but not always advisable to leave it in your sprayer for quite a long time. Um, and the new bottle, the new style bottle does make it quite easy to mix. So you can just mix one litre or two litres or three litres. You don't have to mix up five litres mm-hmm. like you would do with uh, quite a lot of other products. So hopefully that, that answers that one. I don't know, is my sound going now? Am I all right? Uh, it went, went a tiny bit, but it kind of come yeah. back again now. Uh, can you just do that one, one about K authoring and partridge in the spray? Can you just answer that one again? Yeah, so the label says you can store the product safely for your next treatment um, in the sprayer, but we won't be, say, leaving it for you know, any, any longer than that, basically. Um, so we don't need to know for a period of time, if that helps. Um, and the new bottle does make it quite easy for people to mix sort of lower amounts. So you can just mix one liter or two liters or three. You don't have to have five liters each time. So hopefully you can plan out you know, that appropriately, I guess. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Um, What's that vaser being used outside? I assume the mean prevector, obviously there's quite a lot of vaser products. I assume the mean prevector as opposed to vaser cypermethrin or, or something like that. So I'll, uh, for some things, yes, basically it's on the label depending on what your what you're treating um so i don't know what the particular person wanted to treat um some things you can use it outside some you can't read the label uh, eh? yeah um did uh have you devised a did a regime for different do you want me i'll read it out for you so yeah yeah, you yeah, yeah. So, uh, have you devised any regime of using these probably question mark needed so many products effective against any one problem taking care of insect resistance build-up and the long-term availability for use. Is that not better if you mention active ingredient and formulation alongside all these products? Did you get that? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a quite. Yeah, we could. Um, I guess that's more of a point, isn't it, as opposed to a question? Yeah, um, there's no punctuation, so I'm not sure, but yeah. Um, I can't, obviously, Rob, maybe he'll come back on and there was... Uh, Bit of his talk. The reason I've jumped on that is, you know, everyone knows I love Firecam and, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, know Firecam. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> um, so um, I'd help write some of that talk to be fair, mate, especially the history part. Um, no, no, you've done great, you've done great. But yeah, the active ingredients, obviously, yeah, they, I guess they could have. I don't think people would have seen them that well on that particular presentation. Um, cool. And it is, you know, as I hopefully Rob. I, I thought articulated quite well is that you need to think of what, what you're treating and think of the best product for it and the best active ingredient and, and alternate, especially if you're doing bed bugs, really alternate because all we've got is the, if you are doing sprays, it's the brave for So it's about alternating from mm-hmm. delta mephrine to tetra mephrine, permethrin, and, and, and mix it up that way, I guess. Um, Great. Good stuff. No, thank you for popping on, Lawrence. That helped out a lot, right. I think, and took a bit of pressure off of Rob as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's all right. I'm, uh, you know, I'm always saying that. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll say, say goodbye and thank you anyway, Lawrence. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Do you see it? Fabulous. Great. So yes, apologies for the, the the smaller technical issue there, but I think we got through it. I think we got through it. Um, got all the questions answered. Great. Just a couple of minutes over, but yeah, without further ado, we move on to our final technical speaker, which is Clive Bowes from the Pest Management Consultancy. And he'll be again said insect based um, insect biology and behaviour. Um, and yes, Clive, if I can ask you to unmute yourself, that would be great. Yeah, uh, is that unmuted for you? That's perfect. Thank you. Very good. All the best. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Natalie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, amazing to see 184 of you uh, here uh, for this seminar. So terrific turnout. Uh, so I'm just going to start to share my screen here and uh, get this up for you just bear with me one minute we'll get that 
on to full screen. And yeah, hopefully you can see that okay there now. Yeah, so for the next 20 minutes or so, I've been asked to talk about insect biology and behavior. And um, so I was uh, kind of flattered that the BPCA asked me to talk about that. And uh, when I started to put the presentation together, I thought, well, this topic is kind of, it's pretty big. You know, how are we going to cover this in 20 minutes? So I thought I'd start to try to narrow it down a bit. I, I, and one of the questions I get asked a lot when I'm doing train call, training courses and so on is why, why are there so many different insect pests? You know, if you look at the rodents, there's only whatever, two or three, half a dozen max. Whereas with insects, we seem to have got uh, lots and lots and lots, uh, you know, a, a very big number. So I thought I'd develop the presentation around why have we got so many insect pests. So I had a little look at how many pests we've got in the UK. And I had a look at how many insects there were, how many different types of insects in the UK as a whole. It turns out that actually, the pest insects are only about 0.2% of all the total insects we've got. And almost the question is, you know, I found myself turning the question on its head and not asking why are there so many insect pests? Almost the question is, why are there so few? Why have we only got 0.2% of our insects that become pests? So that is kind of really the way I'm going. And I've sort of almost rephrased that question a bit more uh, and, and I guess I'm asking, what does it take for an insect to become a pest? You know, what hurdles has it got to jump over? What hoops has, he, has it got to go through before it becomes a pest? You know, why does only one insect species in 500 become a pest? So, so what does it take? You know, what hurdles does an insect have to jump over to become a pest? Now, normally, you know, if this was a live group face to face, we'd have a little bit of a brainstorming thing going on here, but obviously we can't do that. So I've done the brainstorming for you, and I've come up with, I think it's like about five points, and we're going to talk through each one of those five points in a bit more detail. You know, and the first thing, you know, that makes an insect become a pest is it's got to hang around people. You know, it's got to be associated with people. If an insect lives in the tops of trees, it's not a problem to us. If an insect lives on the you know, grassy fields, it's not a problem. If it lives on the top of mountains, it's not a problem. It's actually got to hang around people. There's got to be something in its biology and its behavior that makes it attractive to people. So we're going to look at that. And then afterwards, we're going to look at something about its reproduction. Um, you know, most pest insects, not all of them, as we'll see, but most insect pests develop really quite rapidly. You know, they can go from zero to full population in a short period of time. That's what makes them pests. So we're going to look at that in a bit more detail. So that'll be interesting. And uh, we're also going to look at dispersion, you know, the ability of insects to spread from place to place, you know, because if our insects stayed in one little place and didn't, you know, be, didn't spread to adjoining premises or adjoining cities or adjoining countries even, they wouldn't be much of a problem. So we're going to have a look at dispersion. A bit of biology and behavior going on in that, certainly. And we're going to have a look at the impact of the pests. You know, by definition, for a pest to be a pest, it's got to have some impact on us. It might just be a nuisance, or it might carry diseases, it might eat the timber in our homes, whatever it is, it's got to have some kind of impact. And then finally, I suppose for a pest to become important, it's got to be difficult to control. You know, a pest that we could just like wipe away with any insecticide in the back of the van wouldn't really be an important pest. You know, important pests are ones that are challenging, they're tricky, they're difficult to control. So that's really what I came up with from my own sort of uh, single brainstorming little session. So I'm going to go back and we're going to work through those five points. Uh, there's nothing here, to be honest, you need to take notes about. There's not an exam at the end. There's not a new product that I'm going to start bigging up in a minute. Um, you know, there's not detailed instructions as to where to put your mouse trap. It's just a bit of a chat about pests, really. You know, before we come on to Ian's final wrap up session after me. So kind of sit back, if you like, enjoy it if you can. And uh, it might give you something to think about. And uh, we'll see, see where it takes us. So 
let's start with the association thing. Um, we're going to focus really through this on the house fly. I figured we ought to pick one pest just because otherwise it becomes really vague and out focus. So we're going to focus on the house fly, but we'll look at some other pests as well. So even if you're not involved with house flies, stick with us because you know there might be some stuff in here that you find interesting or maybe even useful. So we're going to look at the house fly and we're talking about association. So you know when was it that house flies first became associated with humans? So this is a picture. I've dug out a picture of um, Derby uh, about 7,000 years ago. You can see the BPCA offices there in that kind of circular defensive thing. You might just be able to see the peak district in the background there. So this is what you know, early settlements looked like 7,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. And um, this is about the earliest that archaeologists have found the remains of housefly pupae in human settlements. You know, when they dig down into these archaeological excavations and they find animal remains or animal manure or whatever, then they will often find housefly pupae in there. So certainly 7,000 years ago, houseflies were hanging around uh, places, even Derby as it was in its infancy. Uh, and if you look closely at this picture, you can see why. Uh, they've got a lot of animals there. Look, they've got, I don't know what those are, the cattle, uh, you know, in those fields in the foreground. There's somebody within the settlement feeding chickens. So they've got cattle, they've got chickens. There might be some pigs in the background there. So they've certainly got livestock. And where there's livestock, there's manure. And, and I'm sure even 7,000 years ago, if they were doing early farming, they'd have known that if you put the manure on the fields, it helped the crops grow. So they would have been stockpiling manure. But as well as manure, there would also have been refuse, you know, waste, if you like, from those uh, settlements there. And if you look closely, you know, uh, probably on your phone, you won't see it. But if you look, got a, a computer screen there, you just might, might be able to see there's some little piles of what might be waste inside, uh, inside that compound there. So certainly uh, animals uh, and their manure and then waste and refuse from the settlement would have produced flies back then, even 7,000 years ago. So that was then, of course, you know, end of history lesson. In what areas do we find flies now? Well, probably one of the most important sources of flies in this country now is still animal husbandry. Chicken farms and pig farms are big producers of flies. They get involved a lot with environment agency and local authorities in sorting out fly problems. And time and time again, every year, I'm down on chicken farms, sorting out why they've got so many flies there that are spreading out into the community. So animal husbandry was a problem 7,000 years ago. It's still a problem now. And of course, the waste industry as well. You know, we've now got this big flourishing waste industry. We've got that recycling going on, which is great. You know, we're no longer burying stuff in landfill, but it's producing flies. So in a way, you know, flies, uh, their association with humans hasn't changed much in 7,000 years. They still hang around as animal husbandry, poultry and pigs, and they still hang around waste. So that's our little touch on the association of flies with people. Let, let's move on. We should look at reproduction. That was number two on our list. So we're going to have a little look at reproduction and see what we can say about that. And, you know, if you talk with insect ecologist type people, they'll say that insects have got two basic reproduction strategies. One of them is the insects that develop fairly slowly and they've got dormant phases where they can hunger down and survive through difficult times and then pop out later when times are better. And quite a few insects would go down through this route. Uh, the oriental cockroach will be a classic one. You know, the oriental cockroach is a kind of a slow breeding cockroach. It's not like the German one. It's slow breeding and uh, it lays these egg cases, the oetheci, that can survive for two, three, four months, sometimes longer before they hatch out. So they've got this ability to survive difficult times. Even though the active stages have been eliminated, the egg cases are still there and will hatch out in the future. Those are what we call pests that fit this so-called strategy. The other sort of pests 
are ones that multiply really quickly. You know, they take advantage of temporary habitats. Our fly would fall into this category. If you think of some pig manure out in the field or somewhere, some animal manure, you know, that manure is not there for long. The flies have got to find it. They've got to lay eggs on it. They've got to develop quickly and take advantage of it while it's good and fresh. So those are what we call our pests. House flies are in that category. Now, just to remind you with our house flies, how quickly they can develop and to remind you also about the effect of temperature. So these are some figures here for house flies breeding. This is at 16 degrees centigrade, which is cool. You know, this is uh, sort of, you know, cool, mild temperatures, certainly not the warm weather we're having now. At that temperature, flies are in about 45 days. So if we took the English summer at 120 days long, it's four months. If we said that the summer is May, May, June, July, August being typical summer, then if it was only 16 degrees, they'd go through two and a bit generations. And a couple of flies at the beginning would reach to a population of about 700 by the end of the summer. So some flies, but not too bad. If we put the temperature up to 25 degrees, we get a very different picture. The flies are developing much more quickly. Their life cycle is no longer 45 days long, it's now 16 days long. And that means that instead of two and a bit generations, they go through seven and a half generations. And that means at the end of the summer, you know, that population could be as many as 10 million flies. So you can see the effect that increases in temperature have on insect reproduction. You know, these are fly figures, but the same principle would apply to every other kind of insect as well. So reproduction, uh, really, really important. The other point I chip in on this, you might be thinking, well, nowhere is ever going to be te produce 10 million flies, you know, over the course of a summer. You might be right. I don't know. But what will have a big effect on that total number of flies produced is biological effects like predation. And if we went to uh, a chicken farm or a pig farm and we looked at the manure there, we would find quite probably there's lots of insects in the manure, particularly beetle larvae that are preying on the uh, fly larvae and keeping the numbers down. So, you know, on a chicken farm or maybe a pig farm, perhaps it wouldn't reach 10 million because of predation. On a waste site, where there are very, very few, if any, natural predators on a waste site, then that potential for fly multiplication is, um, you know, it, it could be realized because there's no predators nibbling away at the fly numbers. But anyway, that's a little chat about reproduction and development. Let's move on uh, to our third point that we said we'd cover. You know, we should look at dispersion. Like we said, if, a, if an insect stays on the, you know, on the mountains, it's not going to be a problem for people. They've got to disperse. If an insect stays in a single apartment, it's a problem in that apartment, but it's not a problem for the whole block. Uh, and, you know, insects that become serious pests will disperse from apartment to apartment to apartment through a block. So dispersion, whether it's house flies or anything else, uh, is important. I, I thought I'd show you this picture. Years ago, I worked for a few years on locust control in Africa. And, you know, locusts are a classic dispersing pests. And this is just one of those pictures of a locust swarm moving across the Sahel there. So, so the question you might ask, and certainly the question that chicken farmers ask me when we go around to see why there's so many flies, or the question that waste site managers ask me when we go around about all their flies is, why would flies eat habitat? You know, they've got food there, they've got other flies there, they've got the right conditions. It's all good. Why would they want to leave? Well, I guess my answer is, that dispersion you know is a basic biological drive most animals to a greater or lesser extent will disperse you know from that place they brought up they drive to find and colonize new habitats they don't want to just stay simply in one little place and live their whole life there they want to find new places to live so they will spread it's a kind of an insurance policy you know the more places they can colonize and have it and move on and more places beyond that even if a few of these habitats get eliminated by uh, you know drought or pest controllers or something 
there's still those other places they've gone to where the population, where the species can cling on and, um, and survive and spread on further. So dispersion is kind of, it's a behavior that's almost like a, 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 an insurance policy. And like we say, if the flies just stayed on the pig farm, they might be a problem for the pig farmer, but they wouldn't be a problem for the villages nearby. It's the dispersion that makes them a serious or a more serious pest problem. So the dispersion, let's have a little look. You know, everybody wants to know how far does a house fly fly? And, um, you know, and people ask that question as though every fly is attached to like a half mile long piece of string and they fly for half a mile and then they stop because the string goes tight. Obviously, that's not correct. You know, some flies will fly a long, long way. Other flies won't fly very far. You know, there will be a natural variation. This is some figures from the USA, uh, uh, 1952. And, and back in those days, what you're allowed to do was go to like a, a, a landfill site, for example, and spray it with radioactive isotope. And all the flies would become labeled with radioactivity. And then all you had to do is hang up sticky papers half a mile away, one mile away, two miles away, catch lots of flies, check them with your little Geiger counter and see how many had come from the landfill site. So there was nice data produced in those days. This is from America. And uh, so there they can, you can see that uh, lots of flies flew half a mile, about the same number flew a mile away. But by the time you got to two miles, there weren't so many reaching that distance and, and very few reaching three or four miles away. So, you know, we could say that urban America back then, maybe a mile, two miles at the most is about as far as it went. Biology and behavior on that. Let's have a look at the impact of, of insects. Uh, you know, flies have got to have an impact on us to become a pest. And, and if you opened your book on flies, uh, this might be in the BPCA manual, I'm not sure. But it will say that insects have various impacts. They might be a nuisance. They might con contaminate our food or eat our food even. They might cause structural damage, like woodworm, for example. Or they may even carry diseases. So there's a range of different impacts. And that is kind of broadly the range of different impacts that pests have. Different pests will have different impacts within that but that's the, the kind of broad range. So I thought we'd just take, we're still focused on house flies. I know we've mentioned other insects, but we're kind of focusing on house flies just to give a bit of continuity through this otherwise rambling presentation. So I, I thought we'd look at nuisance. We'd have a little look at nuisance and flies, and we'd have a little look at disease transmission and flies as well. So, so the nuisance thing, the, the Environment Protection Act in the UK defines a statutory nuisance as uh, any premises in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or a nuisance. It, it doesn't mention insects, uh, but insects will be covered by this to some extent. So the EPA tries to drive, tried to define a statutory nuisance back then 30 years ago. So I, I get involved a lot in fly problems. Um, I get involved in nuisance issues. I have to go to residents' homes to um, uh, look and try to assess if there's a nuisance going on there. And I just thought I'd share with you a couple of photographs, partly because nuisance is often seen as kind of a vague problem. You know, are these people just complaining because they've got nothing better to do? Are they just making this up? Are they just using nuisance as a lever to try to get to the waste company? And, you know, and it's a lever that is difficult to disprove. So I, I just got a couple of pictures for you here. And um, so this is somebody's kitchen. There's a flypaper that we put up the day before, and this is the next day, and there's the number of flies uh, stuck on that flypaper in 24 hours, roughly. So you can see that's kind of really modern, the kitchen. You know, none of us would really want that going on in our kitchen. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm just seeing if I can move this panel out the way. I'm moving this panel. So this is a note I was given when I was involved in a fly job some years ago, somebody gave me a note and I've kept it ever since because to me, this totally sums up what we mean by nuisance. And I'll read it out for those of you who are maybe looking on your phone and can't, and it's not too clear. It says, August, 50 up to 200 flies killed each day, beyond hope, 
17 day old baby. Each day has been hell. Please help. So that to me kind of captures this idea of nuisance. And, uh, you know, if, if ever you're thinking, well, maybe these people are making this up because they're just having a bit of a go at the chicken farm or the waste site, you know, that's what it can be like for, uh, you know, for people living near one of these locations. So that's nuisance. Uh, we, uh, we're looking at house flies. So look, let's look at disease transmission as well. Now, um, normally with house flies, if you go on the training course, people say, oh, they transmit salmonella and E. coli and food poisoning and all that, house flies, uh, which is, of course, correct. Nothing wrong with that. So I, I thought rather than go over familiar ground, uh, we'd have a quick look at another infection that house flies can carry. It's a, it's a disease called trachoma. Uh, it's an infection of the eyes and uh, it causes severe irritation of the eyes and if it's left untreated will lead to blindness. Uh, and we tend to think of it as a tropical disease now. You know, it's much more common, obviously, in tropical countries. But we do get cases appearing in the UK. There's about two and a half thousand imported cases in the UK each year. And uh, the flies simply land on people and pick up the infection and transfer it to the next, next person. So it's spread by flies. It can also, to be clear, be spread by you know, contact with fingers and so on as well, by rubbing your eyes and, and so on. But anyway, it's a really nasty disease. We think of it as a tropical disease, but actually uh, it used to be uh, really quite common in this country. Those of you, might, some of you might know of the Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, which opened in 1805, so whatever that is, 200 years ago now. Uh, and this hospital was opened mostly to deal with trachoma infections in London then, because in London there were at that time a population of maybe 100,000 horses that were, you know, that's the only transport there was then was horses, 100,000 horses in London in, in the early uh, 1800s. And, and in the summer, therefore, masses of flies, and therefore lots and lots of eye infection of this trachoma. And, and the Morphine's Eye Hospital uh, opened uh, then to try to deal with it. So, you know, we've got a connection, but as we say, or as I said, there are still cases imported in the, into this country now. It, it's not long gone. I was reading something about President Jimmy Carter. I don't know if some of you remember President Jimmy Carter. I think he was before President Nixon. But he was saying when he was a boy growing up in rural America, they used to get eye infections from the flies. Um, uh, you know, coming from animal manure and so on. So yeah, flies, uh, of course they carry salmonella and so on, but don't forget these other infections. You know, we still have them in this country and they used to be uh, a lot more important. But finally, uh, I know time's going by, but I should touch on the difficulty of control of insects. This is what makes them a pest. If they were easy to control, we'd just get rid of them. Uh, uh, and with flies, there's two challenges. One is they breed really, really quickly. So, you know, if we kill a few, it won't make much difference. They will just carry on breeding. You know, we need to kill a large proportion of the flies every day, even to keep the numbers still, and an even larger number to actually start to reduce the total number of flies. It's like trying to run up the down escalator, if you've ever done this, you know, uh, you know when you're younger, possibly, or even now. Uh, you've got to run really fast to go up the going down escalator. It's the same with fly control. You've got to kill a lot of flies every day, every single day to start to reduce the numbers. So reproduction, we've touched on that earlier. And then there's the issue of insecticide resistance, house flies, along with some other insects, you know, bed bugs. I think we talked about bed bugs earlier, but house flies are notorious for developing resistance. And uh, this really makes it difficult to control. I just show you a couple of things here quickly because we're getting near the end. These are findings of a study on flies on uh, animal farms in the UK. And uh, they studied 30, the flies on 35 different animal farms. And they checked out what proportion of the flies were resistant to different insecticides. And just at the top there with permethrin, 30, on 34 out of 35 farms, the flies were resistant to permethrin. Uh, with synergized pyrethrins, it was only 11 out of 35. With azomethophos, which is still used for fly control on farms, uh, 34 out of 34 
out of 35 farms showed heavy resistance to azomethyphos. So there's a lot of resistance out there. Uh, and just in case you were thinking that resistance is a bit slow to appear, here's the results of a, a study on um, uh, the onset of resistance. What this little chart is saying on the left hand side is this is the resistance level before they started using residual pyrethroids. The resistance level was about times 50. They put on one treatment and it worked fairly well. They left it a few weeks because the flies increased and they put a second treatment on that didn't work very well. And when they measured the resistance level after the second treatment, it had gone from 50 up to 250 in the space of a few weeks. So that shows you how quickly the resistance can increase uh, with flies. And the same thing we'll see with other insects as well. So that kind of more or less brings me to the end. Um, just to summarize what we've covered, you know, what does it take to become a pest? What hoops have the insects got to jump through? What hurdles have they got to jump over? The first thing is they've got to be associated with people. Um, you know, if they live in the mountains, they won't be a problem. They've got to reproduce rapidly. You know, flies particularly are a pest because they breed so quickly and they will outstrip the rate at which we can control them. They've got to spread from place to place to place, whether it's flies going from a farm to people's houses, whether it's bed bugs moving from one room to another in an apartment block or in a care home. They've got to have a high impact on us, you know, whether that's nuisance or disease transmission or all those other problems that other pests can cause. And then finally, they've got to be difficult to control. And we've looked, you know, with house flies, uh, you know, the challenges with house flies with their rapid reproduction and their rapid development of resistance to, um, to, uh, to, to different insecticides. So, uh, Natalie, if you're still listening, I think that brings me to the end of what I was going to say. I'm always listening, Clive. I'm just coming okay. back to you now. <laughs> I'm always there. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I'll read out the questions if you are okay with that. Yep. Yeah, far, ahead, far away. Fabulous. So, um, can we have a list of the papers you referenced for further reading, i.e. dispersal specifically? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've got a list of dispersal papers and I'll send that through to you, Natalie. Okay, fabulous. Um, it'd probably be best to send, pop it over to Scott and then he can uh, decide what to do with it. Um, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll punch forward. Yeah, that'd be great. Or pop over to me and I can forward it on, no problem. Yeah, um, I'll send so fabulous. Um, what's the best product or method to use to stop maggots forming at rubbish bins? You, you, you're going to have to look at the label of your products to see what, if any, have got larvae on the label. Uh, I'm not sure any of your standard residual sprays have got larvae on the label now. Our colleagues that spoke earlier may be able to tell you otherwise. So I'm not sure if you've got a larvae side that is approved for use in, in, uh, in, in refuse bins. What I would say is that really the answer to this is cleaning. Uh, you know, if, if you've got regular cleaning of the bin and regular emptying of the waste, there shouldn't be uh, fly larvae in there. So check your label, see if any of your residual sprays have got maggots on the label. If not, your client needs to up their hygiene, clean regularly, and make sure the refuse is taken away regularly. But yeah, it's a worry because of the temperatures we've got now, the temperature today is forecast to hit 30 in various places. Flies are going to go through that life cycle in maybe 10 days. Mm. So it's really rapid. Yeah, absolutely. A lot quicker. Um, great. Thank you for that. Um, next one there. What have we got on here? We've got four open questions. So great. We can uh, um, get through that. Ian said he doesn't need 20 minutes for his bit. So yeah, we'll spend a bit of time on questions. That'd be great. Um, is the UK 2020 in bracket Shirehampton uh, fly research, RE distance they travel published? Hopefully I read that okay. If so, could you provide the reference? Was that the same? The first? No, it's not published. No. Okay. So there's not a reference. Fabulous. Um, so from George here, would it be possible to get the, oh, here we go, another question about the references for fly dispersal. We have uh, a lot of people interested in that. That's fantastic. Um, okay, Kyle, a lot of waste is now moved by road or rail to different points around the country, either for sorting, landfill or incineration. This will certainly increase the speed or range of the fly spread. I think it was more of a comment you know, rather than a question. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, waste has always been moved around, whether it was just taken to landfill or, as you say now, taken to other sorts of separation and recycling and so on. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Flies will be moved around from place to place and, and waste recycling facilities or waste processing facilities will have flies, whether it's larvae or pupae or adult flies, being brought in many times a day within the waste. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, we've only got one. You must have covered uh, all the subjects very thoroughly. No one's got many questions, but certainly some comments. And the last one here is uh, not a question. However, the hashtag insect geek always enjoys listening to Clive Bowes. Another great talk. Thank you. So oh. a good, nice, positive comment there for you, Clive. My pleasure. Um, oh, we've got a couple more popped up, actually. We're unexpectedly. So this happens. Um, OK, so control of flies through international parasites, e.g. wasps. And there's all question marks after this. So Control of flies through intentional parasites, sorry, question mark, for example, okay. wasps. Yeah, there are, uh, there are some organisations who breed up and sell parasitic wasps. Uh, and the idea is you release this wasps, these wasps at places where you've got a fly problem and the flock wasps will seek out the immature stages of the fly and parasitise them and control them. And... Uh, it's used, it's been used fairly successfully in parts of the USA. There's some European companies that do it and they sell mainly to Southern Europe, like Spain and Italy and those places. And um, the, the track record in the UK is not that impressive. Uh, and I don't know why that is. I mean, I've been involved with farms who have bought these parasitic wasps from suppliers. Uh, there's one of the big poultry veterinary companies, as well as looking after the veterinary side of poultry, also supplies these parasitic wasps. So some poultry farms have tried them, but um, you know the results so far have not been great. And I don't know why that is, whether they don't do so well in this climate, you know, maybe they're more adapted to Spain, Italy and California than here in the northern, you know, northern sort of northern Europe. Mm -hmm. or whether it's we don't have the expertise to be able to do it properly i don't know but it is out there the track record isn't great it would be nice if you know if we could get it to work in this country yeah absolutely yeah. fabulous answer thank you um one more question oh no got two more questions they're coming in um what formulation uh have you observed the highest control rate which formulation hmm. I don't uh, I would say at the moment, you know, with flies, if you're involved with, uh, you know, a place where the flies are breeding and developing, uh, and that might be a waste site or an animal farm, uh, you know, let's take hygiene and all that stuff as a given, all those non-chemical measures as a given. But if we're looking at chemicals, then larvicides are probably going to be your best option, you know, because... It, as long as the site is appropriate for that because if you're using a larvae side you're killing the larvae and um uh, you know and therefore you're stopping the adult flies appearing you're nipping it in the bud you know you're dealing with the problem before it occurs because nobody's worried about the larvae as such it's the adult flies that are the problem so if you can use a, a larvae side and there's uh, several products out there that are approved for use in waste sites and animal farms then use those follow the label of course and, uh, and they should kill the larvae and stop the adult flies appearing and therefore prevent all that nuisance before it actually happens. If you're forced to use an adulticide, you know, a product to control the adult flies, then your choice is very limited. You know, mm. really all you've got is pyrethroids. Mm. And um, uh, so you've got your pyrethroids there. If, you've, if you're looking at pyrethroids, choose one with a synergist in there. You know, like we saw on that little table on the on those 35 chicken farms, pyrethroids or pyrethroids with a synergist are going to be more effective than a straight pyrethroid. You know, that synergist will help overcome the resistance. It's not a long term answer, but it will definitely help for a bit. Great. So. Again, thank you for that. Um, we've got we do two more questions, and then I think we'll we will stop it there. Just um, it's great. Everybody's uh, pretty eager to get the questions in. We've got two left, so hopefully um, these will be the last um, two, just for time wise. Um, yeah. Clive, you mentioned fly life cycle rate being sixteen days and twenty five C. 
Is that the fastest you are aware of? Um, Buzzvine said 8.5 days was the fastest, but I don't remember the temperature. Yeah, I just chose 25 because it was like a middle of the road summertime temperature in this country. Yeah. If you go up to 30, it'll get faster and, um, you know, uh, and even a little bit faster than that. So, so yeah, top speed would be probably a bit less than 10 days, a bit under mm -hmm. 10 days, over a week, but less than 10 days. But to do that, it's not just the temperature. They've got to have food of the correct nutrition and all that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got to have absolutely, you know, good nutrition, good temperature, good moisture, and then they'll crack through in a little under 10 days. Mm. Excellent. And the final question, um, are Blandford flies on the increase? Short answer is I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're all over. I mean, I, I, I tell you just one thing on that. So the Blandford fly lives, you know, Blandford is in Dorset and this is a biting fly. It's not a house fly. It's a biting fly. Mm. And, um, uh, and uh, it lives in fast flowing water like streams and rivers and all that chalk streams in Dorset. That's where it occurs naturally. But it will also breed in water features in people's gardens. So if you've got like a, a trickling water thing that you put in your garden plumbed in, and there's like a little waterfall and the water's trickling over a lip and going into a little pool and then into another one, you can get uh, simulium, you know, Blandford fly, black flies, breeding in domestic water features in the garden. And mm -hmm. certainly, even, well, not even, but where I live, we have that. We've got neighbours with water features and they can produce large numbers of simulium and that can be uh, a real problem. If you have got that, get the neighbour to turn the thing off and let it bake dry in the sun for one day a week and you'll mm -hmm. get rid of them. But if you leave it running continually, uh, you know, you can get problem levels of simulium, Blandford fly, even in otherwise dry, you know, residential areas. Fantastic. Great, well, thank you, Clive. That was amazing, as always. I said lots of positive comments there, and I can see uh, yeah, a few more coming up in the chat section. So, great, I really, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, yeah. All right. Bye now. Thanks, Clive. Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, I promise we will finish on time, but just a few bits and pieces of updates from me um, and then some words of thanks. Anyway, um, with COVID-19, we're hopefully coming to the end of it um, and coming out safe and well. Uh, our own businesses will be reopening as far as going back to premises are concerned. And our clients' businesses, if, if they have closed down, will be reopening. So if you haven't already found them on, on the BPCA website, there's a couple of very useful uh, guidance documents. One on becoming COVID-19 secure uh, for your own businesses. And one on becoming pest ready that you can use for your clients' businesses, particularly food related. I mean, we just heard there from, from Clive that uh, flies over the last four months, there could be 10 million of them waiting to greet a premises that wasn't closed down properly, hasn't been checked. Uh, and the same applies, breeding rates for rodents, cockroaches, any food premises that has been lying dormant over lockdown uh, could be faced with, with significant pest problems if they haven't kept their maintenance going, if they haven't kept their pest management going. So guidance document there, it's written in a way that um, hopefully you'll find useful, but also written in a way that your clients or your prospective clients could use it as well. So uh, it's publicly available, both these documents publicly available, they're not locked down just for members, they're there for anyone to use. Um, and a lot of other guidance on the website. So if you haven't visited the website recently, please do. A um, couple of new courses. Um, we're, we're still not yet running physical courses, but we've increased the number of digitally available courses. So um, in July and August, we've got a new course on flies and fly control uh, that Paul Westgate will be running for us. So it's a one day course. Uh, you'll be sitting wherever you choose to sit in front of your laptop, but it will be running like a classroom course. So flies and, and their control coming up in July. And then in August, we've got stored product insects, SPIs for the food 
environment, which John Lloyd will be running for us. So a couple of our consultant members running these one day courses. We'll also, uh, we've been doing a lot of work to get the advanced technician program available digitally, both um, some input and assessment, and also our certificate in bird control. So both of these will be becoming available online. Um, yeah, it, we've, we've had to speed up our switch to digital. There was a plan, but what we would planned to do over the next two years, we've had to deliver in the last three months. And that included these events. Um, and this is the third one, and it, it's gone extremely well again today. I know there was a few intermittent sound problems, but that's just what happens in the digital world. So um, we will keep these digital webinars going. Um, we haven't got a date set for the next one, likely to be late August into September, but we will we'll keep them going um, because we just we don't know when physical events will start to happen again. On physical events, however, PESTEX, it should be in your diary for the 17th and 18th of March 2021, um, and we're fully intending that that will happen. We spoke to Excel in London, and they intend to be up and running by then as well well um another plug tomorrow for members we've got our second member huddle um i'm leading the one tomorrow just looking at covid 19 the impact that it's had on us on businesses how ready were we for it how ready were we going into lockdown and really what could we've done that, that might be usefully different as pest control businesses so Maximum 20 members, it, it's come and share um, your thoughts and views and, and hear the thoughts and views of others. So that's tomorrow at 12.30. Beyond that, really just want to say a huge thank you to everyone today, particularly our sponsors. Um, so thank you, Kilgern, for Spence sponsoring today's event. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for for chairing it, and thank you to our speakers. We had some great sessions today. Thank you, Tony from Lodi on on bed bugs. Uh, thanks, Natalie, for your session on bees and wasps. Thanks, Rob, and and also Lawrence for coming to the rescue, looking at alternatives to FICAM. And thank you, Clive, for um, the insect behaviour and biology that uh, finished off our our morning session. If you've got things that you'd like to cover in these sorts of events, then by all means, um, let us know. We, we do, we'll continue doing both these half day events, as I've said. We'll also continue doing our webinars. Uh, we've got one coming up in July that will be looking at social media and how we, we use that. Um, so do keep an eye on the website, the webinars, which are the short one hour sessions will continue as well. So um, lots of things to keep you up to date. Um, and I say anything that you feel we should or could be doing as a trade association, just drop, drop us a line, let us know. Um, beyond that, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that you stay safe and stay well. Uh, as we come out of lockdown and I, I wish you a good summer and hopefully we'll we'll catch up again before too long. Okay folks, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>